Um, so you're constantly sort of fighting for just the thing that's yours that's that makes you different to your twin but you've also got a best friend that you've known since you before you were born <laughs> so um so he kind of became the leader of our group i guess when we were sort of hanging out at the park and it's that age where you first start getting that independence um and he was always kind of i guess trouble he was always in trouble the older one but and a bit of a bully but that kind of i suppose as a kid you still want to just be accepted by that person we'd only been friends with them for a few months um this is when they started i guess but we didn't know it was a time drew's pushed me down and just dry humped like with clothes on but um and for maybe five ten seconds at the most but it would like push my legs apart and yeah just dry humped on top of me for a minute honestly um at least once a week and james and drew and his friend james would sort of take their pick with me and my twin there's like i've suffered with psychosis on and off um when i've had psychotic episodes i've been worried that they were in the house i could hear their voices um so it's like two in the morning i guess now i've overdosed to try and get rid of kill the chance of pregnancy from rape when the stops then i think as you get oh, as i got older i started going through puberty and your body's changing and you're becoming sort of a young adult and getting all those different hormones and feelings and you start then realizing how wrong it is and what actually happened to you i wish i'd had the courage to tell someone Hello, so today we have got a harrowing story of someone who is extremely brave and talented. She wrote her life story when she was just a teenager and I think that helped her process some of what she's been through but she's still living with the trauma of the horrors that she went through as a younger person. And many of you are aware that on this channel stories of this nature now this channel uniquely is under a uk police requirement to ask the guest if they waive their anonymity to tell the story on this channel do you waive your anonymity nita yes okay so we've got that bit out of the way if stories of a dark nature harrowing involving horrible things that happen to kids if that is not something that you feel psychologically you want to sit through right now perhaps you might want to skip this one and come back and watch some of our other content so we are going to begin now all right well huge thank you for coming on oh yeah yes, I'd like thank to, you i'd like to say um nita has a youtube channel as well which the link will be in the description box so please go down and subscribe and and watch what she's doing there because um it, it is mind-blowing um to hear her story what she's been through and how she's emerged from it yeah Hi. thanks so much for having me on here um what is your youtube channel called sorry nights in the asylum that's okay. where the name nita comes from if anyone wants to check that out um yes, yes. where should i start were you raised in in the uk um so i was born in london um got lived with my mum and dad um there's five of us siblings so i've got an identical twin two younger brothers and an older sister. Um, sort of grew up in London early years and then we moved to where we live now. Um, I think I was eight. Um, sort of growing up, have a really loving family environment. Obviously no one's perfect, but I always had that sort of stable home environment to go back to, which I know a lot of people who sort of end up with sort of lives like mine <laughs> haven't sort of had that luxury I guess so I'm so grateful for that and um yeah to start when I was I've suffered with like eating problems eating disorders and stuff and I've had a lot of mental health that I suppose started eight nine years old um but I remember the first time ever feeling fat and worried about my weight I was about six and I think I'd seen a picture or like a sports day at school or nursery it would have been that young and wondering if I was sort of bigger than everybody else. Um, my mum suffered with weight issues growing up 
and she had a gastric band and worked her butt off and lost 17 stone um but that was <laughs> that was sort of whilst I was growing up um and she didn't want us to sort of suffer with the bullying and everything that comes with being overweight as a kid so we were always sort of conscious of what we were eating um when I was eight and we had moved out of London um we'd started judo so super fun but um you get weighed for that um so it's quite public weighings and if you'd put on weight it was just the most embarrassing thing the adults would like take the mick out of you not just the kids and if you lost weight it didn't matter how you'd done it you'd sort of get praise for that and so that's sort of where the eating problem started would you say it was ingrained into you from a very young age from your mother then obviously your judo class i think so um once judo started i'd never we hadn't had to concentrate on our actual weight as in the numbers until judo but i think our first weighings we were about 43 kilos and i was heavier than my twin which that's about six stones so as an adult look and we were tall kids so as an adult looking back that's not that much i suppose in terms of weight but we were the heaviest for our age so we had to move down um so we had to really concentrate on trying to eat healthy and just cut out junk um to reach the under 40 kilo category which is what we used to fight at from sort of eight years old um i think when we first started we were a little bit chubby so it was easy to just cut out rubbish and eat normally and then we'd lose weight but i suppose when that stops i think i lost a good five or six kilos and it sort of became became a competition between me and my twin because I'd started off heavier than her. And when I lose weight, when I first lost weight and became less than her, I know it just really annoyed her and you're always kind of competing as twins, um, always compared to them. And it was always sort of, we were always referred to by other fam by other people, everyone except our parents pretty much as the twins, the girls, that was it. Um, so you're constantly sort of fighting for just the thing that's yours that's that makes you different to your twin but you've also got a best friend that you've known since you before you were born <laughs> so um, I think my first judo competition I lost so much weight that I had to be moved down a category and just the buzz I felt was um, like I'd made everyone proud but it was also like a, hey, you're the fat twin to my sister so even though she wasn't fat we were both obviously tiny um but that continued even after judo and i did judo until i was 12 and i stayed at under 40 kilos until i was 12 as well from eight years old and i think around this time we'd also met some new friends who just moved into the area as well so we had that in common with them there were two brothers and one was two years younger than us and the other one was about six years older than us five or six years older than us um so he kind of became the leader of our group i guess when we were sort of hanging out at the park and it's that age we first start getting that independence um and he was always kind of i guess trouble he was always in trouble the older one but and a bit of a bully but that kind of i suppose as a kid you still want to just be accepted by that person even if they're really horrible um so he'd always kind of pit everyone against each other and he was quite nasty to his little brother as well um so the little brother were called Charlie and um the older brother Drew. Um I think we, we were still eight and it was when we'd we'd only been friends with them for a few months. Um this is when the abuse started, I guess, but we didn't know it was abuse at the time. Um Can I go into detail? Yeah, how did it start? <laughs> Um, so we were at the park and there was a kid that had fell off the slide or something. So my, my twin had gone over to see if she was okay and we became friends. So she was there and then the brothers, Charlie and Drew were in the park. Um, and there weren't any adults around. It was just me and my sister and the kids. So they were sitting, I think they were playing spin the bottle under a, like a two story climbing frame. Where You're eight. Yeah. <laughs> um, not. I don't know, they're playing it as, as dares, so it would be like silly dares, but obviously we, we were eight and Charlie was six or seven and 
the other friend was even younger so it was only drew that was about 12 or 13. the bottle landed on beth who's the kid who'd fell off the slide um who was quite a lot younger than us maybe six or seven at the very most and drew said i oh i dare you to kiss charlie so they kissed on the lips and then like that's disgusting as you are at that age and then they spun the bottle again and it landed on I think it was me. It was me on my twin. I block a lot of this out. Um, and Drew would often dare people to do stuff with him. Um, or it might have, I think it was one of them sends. It was either Charlie or Drew's. Oh, I dare you to shag Drew. So Drew's pushed me down and just dry humped like with clothes on. But um, and for maybe five, ten seconds at the most, but it was like, pushed my legs apart and sort of yeah just dry humped on top of me for a minute um about 10 20 seconds at the very most and that's kind of how that started um we didn't tell any adults because i don't know I, it felt obviously i didn't know the word but violated sort of really vulnerable it's a vulnerable position to physically be in but we didn't tell anyone kind of brushed it off um we carried on playing at the park after that. So we'd have school, then hanging out at the park with friends and judo. And that was sort of our lives then. Um, the abuse kind of went on from that. And Drew had other friends his age. So he's about 13, 14 at this point. Um, so we would have been nine. And it had become from like just a couple times, look, like, once every few months or something to almost every other time we'd hang out. And especially if Drew was with, especially if Drew was with his other friend, um, it would start. <laughs> Sorry, there's a kid playing in the garden. <laughs> That's why we're giggling. Um. Um, this is like back in the days before every kid had a phone and internet. So we'd be out playing games we'd make up in the park and some of them would be fun. Um, but Drew, by this time, had a friend we'll call James, um, who was his age. I think they're thir 14, 13 and 14 at this point. So we were about nine. And they'd play in the park with us. So I guess they'd be babysitting their younger sibling, Charlie. Um, so we'd all be out in the park together and We'd play group games when there was loads of us in the park, like 10 to 15 kids. And we'd play one called Kings and Queens, um, where you'd have sort of two kingdoms, opposite ends of the park. There'd be two teams and you'd just go and <laughs> throw rocks and beat the shit out of each other in the middle, like um, sort of fake fighting. Lots of fun. Um, yeah, so we made this game called Kings and Queens in the park when there was lots of us, um, usually like over 10 kids. And we'd make two teams, opposite ends of the park, build a fort on each side and that would be our kingdom. And then we'd go and have like like little wars and throw rocks and sticks at each other, or like pretend sword fights, all that stuff you do as a kid. Um, but Drew was the king on one side and his friend James was the king on the other side. And I was on one side and my twin was on the other side um so that turned into well i'm the king and you're the queen so um that's we do grown-up stuff and but um both the boys together had sort of started making me and my twin do sexual favors by this point um it's going to get a bit graphic i apologize yes. but um not like full on intercourse or anything but um they'd like make us give them hand jobs and um touch us and um obviously i was nine we were nine and um they were sort of 14 um so that happened on that particular incident and i'd left my sort of team to go over because I, it was just horrible so i went to go and find my twin and she was on the second floor of the climbing frame which was sort of hidden off from view so adults couldn't see 
and um, it, whoever it was, Drew or James on that side, I can't remember off by heart which one of them it was, but they were touching her and um, I think I might have physically grabbed her like, come on, we're going. Um, and by that point, the the older boy who was on the other team, who'd been on my team, had managed to get all the kids to gang up on my twin and were throwing like proper rocks and mud at her and she was crying and it was horrible. <laughs> um, we left, but um, I think at that age, even when someone's bullying your siblings, it was like, I still didn't say anything because I don't know, it's, I felt hated by all the kids at school, like something was wrong with me. No one ever wanted to be friends. So it's like, if they weren't attacking me, then it was, well, not okay, but um, I just couldn't ever stand up for us. Um, so we left and we'd obviously gone home. I think we might have had judo training that night. Um, and judo had got really intense by this age. So that kind of took away the pain of sort of not, I'd say the bullying at school was mainly just not being included. Like there was something wrong with us. Like no one liked me. I didn't have any friends. Um, but judo was always that one place that I felt safe and happy. Um, and I was good at it and we used to compete and we'd be in the newspapers sort of every couple of months. Um, and I'd, I remember after my first couple of competitions, I'd be bringing my medal or trophy into school, like proper happy and really proud of myself. Um, but then after a few- <laughs> Sorry, my stomach. Uh, um, but after a few times, sort of the kids started calling us the judo freaks and bullying us, I think. And looking back now, it might be jealousy, but at the time it was just, it made me start hiding any of my successes. Um, so anytime I'd been in a competition, I'd like, I'd hide my medals. I wouldn't bring anything like that to school. And um, I'd just hope and hope that no one had seen my face in a newspaper. Um, because sometimes a teacher would say, oh, oh, wow, well done. Like I saw you on this, that and the other and yeah, well done. And then the kids would it just more reason to not like us. Um, Did your parents know what was going on? No, so we never told them. And I think because whilst I was still junior school age, um, my behaviour wasn't that bad. So we've just turned channeled the pain inwards and I think if they'd known, whenever they did find out sometimes that we were being bullied, like it would just come out, I think when a kid's under that much pressure, you can hide it and hide it, but then eventually it just all comes out in one big sort of explosion of emotion or actions. And that's sort of always how I've been. Um, and they, my parents always, even now, sort of ask, well, why didn't you tell us you were in trouble? We would have helped, silly. Like... <laughs> Um, but I think because we were so good at judo, it was like when you have a taste of sort of that level of achievement at such a young age and we were like told like, if you stick at this, you could be in the Olympics. Like when you have just a taste of that at such a young age, it's like nothing else will ever match that. And then you feel like a failure at absolutely everything else. Um, so at school, I never really struggled with academically. I was just good at everything. I didn't really have to try or focus and I'd be top of the class. And um, I was good at sports and music as well. So I never really had to try. Um, and I enjoyed learning, I used to find it interesting <laughs> as a kid. Um, but I think that might have been partly another reason for the bullying from school. Um, but Drew, so the older brother, who's one of the abusers, he he had a lot of, all of his friends, a lot of their young, younger siblings were in my year at school. So he'd turn everyone against us and the older kids his age started bullying us. So Drew's group of 14 and 15 and 16 year olds were really quite badly bullying me and my twin. Um, and that sort of reached a breaking point when I was 11 and I'd been like harassed by this point for about three months consecutively where it was almost every single day and I'd just go home crying my eyes out from school and I was still in junior school and these are all high school kids and um 
during this time was the abuse continuing um yeah sorry i'm jumping back no, no, <laughs> forward and back a bit with timings um my memory's not what it used to be sorry um, just at your time. i can't believe what i'm hearing this is absolutely horrendous this god like using it what nine to eleven and these people are four years five years older than you oh my god Mm. This is mm, disgusting. So sad. Disgusting. Um, so I'm going to uh, try my best to do it in order. Yeah, go so for it. So it's easier to understand because I've jumped forward and back a lot. <laughs> I apologise. Okay. But um, I think obviously the bullying at school, the kids have started to also call us the calorie freaks because I remember seeing my mum read the cal back of calories when she was quite big at the time as well. And to help us keep weight down for judo she just sort of they'd never like um they'd never physically force us to diet or anything they were always up to us um but my mum would she'd always read calories i remember hearing the word calories at quite a young age um but not really knowing much about them at sort of eight just knowing not to have too many but when judo started to get more intense um, and we were doing sort of more advanced competitions and like representing the south of England and stuff. Um, it was sort of really, really important, like extra important to stay under those weight categories. So I noticed my mum would read the back of food packaging before she'd let me eat something, yes or no, based on the, whatever was on the back. So I remember, I think I was nine and I asked her, oh, why do you read the back of the crisps or whatever before? I have it and she said oh because it's it's here's the calories and showed me how to read the calories so if it's over, i think she said sort of if it's more than 100 then it make, might make you fat for judo but if it's less then it will be okay to have it it wouldn't have been in those exact words but obviously as a kid that made me think okay so anything more than 100 calories i won't ever eat um that's dangerous <laughs> Um, and I think eating disorders and stuff weren't so well known at this age. Um, God, that makes me feel old. <laughs> but um, calories and everything, it it seemed okay to tell someone, oh, oh watch what you watch your weight. You'll put on weight if you eat that. To even kids, and it's I think now compared to now, a lot of people are more consciously aware of not to talk about calories and weight and body size around kids and sort of how much they do actually understand at quite young ages. But I think once I learned how to read calories, I didn't really have internet at the time to sort of, I mean, the internet was there, but it wasn't sort of what it is now. So um, I didn't have anywhere to Google research um, of how many calories should I be having a day? What is a normal weight for my age and height? You shouldn't have to at that age. I think there was times at school where I think it would be like science health lessons where they weigh everybody and measure everyone's height to see how much you were growing. But because I was always so tall, I was always way heavier than all the other kids. Um, I was quite muscly at that age as well because we do so much exercise. I loved weightlifting and doing freaking handstand press ups and pull ups, one arm pull ups at like nine. I had like yeah. a six pack and I used to, I didn't mind getting called a man by everybody. You were called a man? <laughs> yeah, by the other kids, I think, because we were just so muscly. Um, but I remember, I don't think I've even put this in my book, but being maybe confused or just knowing I didn't feel like a woman all the time. And I'd look at sort of when you get posters of like a male body or a woman's body, I'd look at the man's body and think I want to look like that. Um, not so much as a man, but just the six pack muscles. I'd never look at a woman's body and think I want to look like that. Um, it's that kind of, I suppose, uncomfortableness with the way I look and my body and gender, I guess, and sexuality. That sort of started about quite young, say 10, 11. Um, I'm going to go just go back to the abuse and then we can stop talking about it. Okay. Um, if that's so right. Um, so 9, 10, it would be a couple times a week, honestly, um, at least once a week and James and Drew and his friend James would sort of take their pick with me and my twin. Was it always in the park? Usually in the park, but sort of wherever we were hanging out. But also at this time, I'd started taking Charlie, the younger brother, I'd started taking his medication to lose weight because 
I didn't know at that age it was um, amphetamines, it was Ritalin, but he used to hate taking his tablets for his ADHD. And I asked him why he hates it and he said, because it makes him not hungry and he quite likes eating. So a light bulb moment at my nine-year-old um, brain thinking, oh, cool, if I take them, then I won't be hungry. So I'd take them and we wouldn't eat all day. Um, me and my twin would make diets up. Um, one was called three, two, one. Um, where we'd have, I think, three hours exercise, two liters of water and one meal a day. Um, so we, it's, lunch was quite hard to skip at school because the teachers are sort of monitoring it, I guess. Um, but breakfast, you could just run out to school quickly and skip it. And then lunch, if we could skip it, if I couldn't, we'd just eat lunch and then either an hour of either running or weights, usually running or skipping jump rope, um, and then going to judo for two hours. Um, and then I'd come back and run on the treadmill sometimes 5K after that, um, because my dad had bought it for my mum at the time to do some walking on. Um, but the taking the Ritalin obviously really helped that. Um, but my twin found out and started, oh, give me some or I'm telling mum, <laughs> which carried on into... Um, Adult life that happened again when we were a bit older with some different things. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> sorry, I forgot what I was going to say. That's all right. You said that um, something else happened with the abuse that you're going to talk about. Um, yes, thank you. So, Looking back now and when I sort of tell anyone about that abuse, they must think sort of why on earth would you go back to the park or go back to hanging out with these people that are doing these things to you? Just a kid, weren't you? Didn't yeah. any better. I think um, it was also because not just being a kid and wanting to be accepted and thinking that this is normal, everyone else must go through this too. But I stayed friends with Charlie to get Ritalin off him to lose weight and to stay friends with him often his older brother would be there. Um, but when me and my twin would take it, it would just make it easier to not eat all day. And say we were allowed out till 8 p.m., we'd lie and say, oh, we're eating dinner at so-and-so's house, but they're not eating until nine. So we'd stay out for like an hour or two later and not have to eat anything. And it just felt great. And um, it was great for a while, but I think when you're starving, which eventually we were, I guess. We never re reached like an emaciated weight, but we'd always be competing with each other as well as for judo whilst growing at least a foot taller in those four years that I stayed under six stone from eight until 12 years old. Um, but about 11, so the, the abuse, I don't know. I think because the abuse made me quiet and withdrawn at school and I guess at judo, it made it, made me less made me fit in even less I suppose so even at judo we started getting picked on by a couple of people and it wasn't sort of like horrific bullying but it was more than not being including no one wanting to be around you or being like last to pick last picked for teams and stuff um there was quite a bad incident where we'd gone swimming originally to burn calories <laughs> um to lose weight I think we were t 10 or just before 10 by this point and Charlie asked if he could come so we thought this would be great but Charlie was then only allowed if his older brother Drew came who's the abuser and Drew wanted to bring James his friend who's also abusing us so but how, how would we get out of that suddenly not want to go or couldn't tell our parents um I don't know I just felt dirty like it was our fault or we'd be in trouble because what happened on this occasion so we went to the swimming pool and we were originally going to go to a really boring one that was just perfect for lane swimming. Um, and it's quite funny sometimes like the swimming, <laughs> we'd be like to try and make the other one fatter than each other. We'd like, I'd be sneaking my food from my plate onto her plate when mm. our mum wasn't looking, <laughs> like thinking that that was going to make her gain loads of weight. <laughs> mm. um, and like swimming, we'd be like swimming lanes, like pushing and shoving and <laughs> like pulling each other's hair and just adults must have looked at us <laughs> thinking we were horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Proper sibling rivalry. <laughs> um, and we couldn't stop swimming until the other, like, no, I have to do one more length than the other one. I remember once we went to like an outdoor one and we swam for about three hours. Um, it was just crazy. But so this time, 
think we're 10 at this point. And this is one of the last incidents, I suppose, before we stopped hanging out with the brothers. Um, so we've gone swimming and it was a fun swimming pool with like um, slides and a pirate ship used to have um, um, rapids and all that stuff. And we couldn't swim that well. I could sort of keep my head above the water but we weren't confident swimmers by any means. So I remember before we went and we I'd started answering back to Drew and James by this point and saying, no, it's just us, you don't need to come. And I think they'd said like, oh, what was your problem kind of thing. And I've said, oh, you're probably gonna try and take our bikinis off in the pool and stuff like that. And it, whichever one of them it was said, oh, why would we do that? You're disgusting as if, but I know that if we hadn't said that, that's what exactly what they would have done. Cause we had those sort of string tying bikinis mm. and it's so easy to just pull them off. Um, quite a lot happened at the swimming pool that I think I'm not going to go into all of it. I'll go into as much as yeah, I can. can uh, please feel it. free to ask any questions like no matter how weird or gross it gets, but, um, I think my memory blocks out quite a lot and it's only when I reread what I've already written in my diaries and stuff that I sort of remember how bad it was. But Charlie, he's still younger than us. I think he's about, he would have been eight at this point. And Drew and James, what, 14, maybe 15 now. And we were 10. So Drew was constantly bullying Charlie, like dunking him for a really long time. And Charlie couldn't swim at all. He still had armbands on. Um but we were all there swimming without any adults. So I remember we went to, there was like a jacuzzi in the middle of these rapids and the boys made us sit on their laps and were like playing with themselves and touching us. But it's, I never saw them, this is really gross, massive trigger warning, but I, I never saw them properly like ejaculate as you do as an adult. So I think it's like they were maybe even just doing what they've been taught and it doesn't excuse it, but I've always sort of wondered, you know, cause they can't have had that many sort of the hormones and stuff that make you sexual and that at that age, cause they were so young when it started, they started doing it to us as well. Cause her, you had complaints about you five all day and you've been asked to leave. So you need to leave the premises now or we'll be calling the police. I didn't know what to do. And Drew started shouting and swearing at him, which only seemed to make the situation worse. Charlie pleaded with the manager, but we left the pool. Can't we even sit outside in the car park? We're not doing anything wrong. So I didn't want to go further than the car park because obviously there's adults and staff there. So I knew they couldn't do anything with all the adults around, sort of away from obviously the swimming pool, which there's quite a lot of... Um, little corners and stuff to hide and do all that. Um, they'd abused us again in the changing rooms after the pool quite badly and like Drew stole Charlie's clothes so he made him have to run through the changing area naked um, banging on the door to get his clothes up um, to get his clothes back um, like me sitting on James's lap again um, but he just had a towel on I didn't know until I was on his lap that he had nothing on under that towel. Um, like Tilly put my hand there. And so there was abuse in the pool, after the pool in the changing rooms. And then we'd gone out and wanted to just go home, but we knew it was too early to call mum because then she'd know we'd been kicked out <laughs> and we didn't want to get in trouble. So we went over to, um, there was like a forest area next door Um, there was a forest area next door, um, next door to the swimming pool. Um, it was like a woods and playground and stuff and quite a big woods, so big enough to go out and explore. And we'd gone to the woods that were local to us before with James and Drew, but it always turned into them abusing us um, or bullying us and then us trying to leave um but not be able to find our way back because they take us into the woods somewhere that we wouldn't be able to get our own way back. So we had to stay with them. And I didn't want that happening in these woods. I knew, I knew that would happen. So we went to the woods um, because we weren't allowed to sit outside the pool. Um, but me and my twin and Charlie, um, I think it started off fairly fun. I think we ended up building a little base, but 
I think Drew had grabbed like a big stick and he was either hitting Charlie with it or um, or chasing him with it or just horrible bully boy stuff, but nothing sexual. Um, I think they'd gone for a wee, so they had the um, bits out and they'd taken us into the woods deep enough for us to we were almost too deep in the woods to be able to find our own way back um but i think it wasn't sorry can we pause for a second can i skim through that because i want to do it in order but i just i block a lot of this out <laughs> so, so it's like when it's on paper then i don't have to think about it because it's it doesn't have to be in here now it's on here um One bit of the woods because I'm going to skip all this. <laughs> okay, I'm going to skip a little of that because it's. <sighs> Do you feel like you're reliving it when you read it? Only for like a moment. So, no, I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Um, ready to start. Okay. Um, so, we were in the woods at this point, and they were trying to get us to suck the dicks. It was like one thing that I'd never do out of all the abuse. Um, I think they'd only really physically tried to get us to do it maybe once before and the rest of the times of them trying to get us to do that that particular thing was all verbal but we were in the woods and um like James and Drew um me and my twin like one each <laughs> and I sort of knew the drill by this point and thought like you're just you know just lay quietly it'll be over in a minute but um they were trying to get us to suck suck them so I think I've been pushed on the floor they got slapped in the face um sort of dragged by the scruff of my neck on my clothes to it was James or Drew had pulled me down on the floor trying to get me to suck um but I wouldn't so I should have just bit it thinking back now <laughs> um <laughs> crying by this point and I think Drew had hit or beaten up Charlie so Charlie was crying as well and um I managed to there was like a tiny little space where I thought it's now whenever I, I can escape so I managed to get up I think the boy that was on me um had his back turned for just a minute so I got up and then I grabbed by her hair to put her up like come on we're going um because I think she wouldn't have left without me and I wouldn't have left without her and I think the boys knew that and they'd often use that um sort of subconsciously um so I think we just ran as fast as we could um it was hard I can't remember why my legs were hurting I think because of the abuse that had happened in the pool um, but we just ran and ran and ran. I felt bad for leaving Charlie with them because I knew it's like now we were gone, he's who they'd pick on. But we just had to get out of that situation. So we ran, we ran back to the swimming pool and just sat outside and called mum. And I think I was still in that heat of being really stressed and upset and not that conscious about hiding the abuse and what we'd done because I felt dirty and disgusting and at that moment in time I was still so sort of stressed or had that adrenaline running through me from what had just happened that I think when I called mum I said like can you just pick us up it's just me and my twin now um yeah the boys we've left them they wanted to go off and do their own thing and they're going to get their own way back <laughs> um and my mum was obviously because they were still kids as well she didn't want to like she didn't want to leave them with no lift back if that wasn't the case um because obviously she's the responsible <laughs> parent and if she'd got us somewhere she'd get us home too 
Um, but um, I think she said, like, why? Why aren't you? Where are the boys? And I said, just really, really quickly and probably quietly as well. Like, oh, they said we can only stay with them if we suck their dicks. So, um, and mum kind of asked down the phone, like, what? And I was just like, no, no. Um, oh, no, don't worry, you know. Um, but I just, we fell out with them. Can you come and pick us up? And she didn't ask about it again, but that made me think, um, shit, she's heard and it's not okay. And it, when she said what, it was kind of like the same tone of voice as that I'd hear when I'm in trouble. So I thought we'd be in trouble. Um, and something else happened around that time. And I only found this out a couple of years ago. Our older sister, who's nine years older than us, had, um, she'd had a dream that I had been raped at the time and my twin had been abused about, by the boyfriend she was with at the time. And that was in the dream. And we were 10 at that time. And obviously, how can you ask a 10 year old, hey, I had this dream, did this happen? Because you think that they don't even know what that is. But, um, I'm not a religious person, but I'm quite spiritual and I do think you get signs and stuff. Like I get sort of warning dreams or, you know, you just suddenly have a feeling and you are worried about a person. You might not have spoken to them for years, but you just suddenly have this feeling of like dread, like something bad's going to happen and you need to call them. I get that sometimes and it often checks out to be justified after it's happened a few times, like almost like pre-warning someone of a car crash that actually then happened. Six cents. Yeah. <laughs> um... But yeah, my older sister, she had a dream that we'd been raped at around the time that it happened. And we didn't find out until years after. And just so many little things that were sort of signs, but on their own, you could just pass them off. And it's only when you put it all together, all the dots. I just, I wish I'd had the courage to tell someone because that abuse, I think when it's going on, especially as a kid you're so resilient when you're a kid because that's all you know and it's all you're sort of taught of adult life is it's shit everyone feels like this it's everyone feels shit 100 percent of the time this is completely normal get on with it so when it's happening you can quite easily block it off and go somewhere in your mind like it's just a body and it's you don't have to be in there in here i know it sounds really cheesy but when the abuse stops then I think as you get oh, as I got older, I started going through puberty and your body's changing and you're becoming sort of a young adult and getting all those different hormones and feelings and you start then realizing how wrong it is and what actually happened to you. Um and that's when the real pain starts, I think, because my behaviour and stuff got so bad at school after that. Um, I stopped caring, started feeling really depressed, self-harming, binging and purging because I just, we quit, I quit judo I think just because I was so depressed and I just wanted to not be bullied about it anymore. Um, so after, like, after the abuse, I think so there was a swimming pool incident and then the sort of finale, if you will, <laughs> um, in the park when I've tried to get the Ritalin off Charlie and his older brother's there and it's gotten into a full-on rape but like Drew would constantly make his younger brothers, one of his younger brothers, so Drew and Charlie had younger siblings as well and they'd make them watch porn and stuff. And um, so that they, I think they'd been watching porn on one of their phones, either at the swimming pool or just before we've gone in, dunking Charlie, just being absolutely horrible. And then at this point we're sat in like a jacuzzi, there's no adults. There was one person in there when we went into the jacuzzi, but he'd left by now. So I think I was sitting on, Drew's, Drew or James's lap and my twin would have been sitting on the other one um, just touching us and stuff but I think eventually did, did they penetrate you? no um, but they'd like stick their fingers in but I was never like low enough to go properly in but um, like enough to bleed sometimes um I think one of them had started, we'd started jumping from, once we'd got off their laps, they'd started sort of jumping or throwing Charlie from the jacuzzi over the 
railings and into the rapids and he couldn't swim so they'd kicked us out of that bit so we got to finally leave that part of the pool um a few other things happened but just on the similar lines here's a message from our sponsor so jen have you ever like signed up for a gym or something or other and then they just keep taking this money out of your bank yes it's really really frustrating um you know if you want to cancel you want to cancel straight away do you know why free trials renew without your consent? It's something that drives me mad. Absolutely mental. Of course, it's a business scam out to get you. <laughs> Don't let greedy corporations pocket your money. Download Truebill to take care of your subscriptions. Truebill is the new app that helps you identify and stop paying for subscriptions. That you don't need, want or simply forget about. On average, people save up to $720 a year with Truebill. Which is approximately 500 quid. <laughs> because these damn companies make it hard to cancel your subscriptions, Truebill makes it incredibly easy to cancel. Just link your accounts and Truebill will make it easy to cancel your subscriptions in one tap. And your true bill concierge is there for when you want to cancel any unwanted subscriptions. So you don't have to. Stay on top of your spending with True Bill. Get an effortless breakdown of your finances to see where your money is going and how to improve. True Bill will notify you of important events that need your attention so you're never caught off guard again. Like Jennifer B, he says, with your help, our family has saved 500 and $87 this year on unnecessary subscriptions. I really didn't understand how Truebill could help me until we decided to save for a very large home purchase. So don't fall for subscription scams. Start cancelling today at truebill.com forward slash Sean. S-H-A-U-N. So go right now to truebill.com forward slash Sean. It could save you thousands per year. Thank you for supporting our sponsors. It's very important for the podcast production. And the links, as usual, are in the description box below this video. Um, what a game at the pool. At the pool. And I think some adults had seen it, but just laughed, laughed it off. What? Thinking like, oh, it's just kids. Or I think, I don't think we could have looked the same age because, you know, you get kids being couples and stuff, but... He still looked a lot older than us. I don't know if it's because we were so tall. We always looked a lot older than we were. Um, and maybe that's where it was Because you were underwater, passed. it was kind of hidden though, probably. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'd started realising it wasn't, wasn't normal by that point because there wasn't many, if any, other people that would do that to us. But them two boys, Drew and James, they'd do it to other girls. There was at least six other that I knew of at the time that they'd done things with. As young as you? Yeah, some younger. Oh, um, Jesus. I mean, where did they learn that behaviour? They're, they're young boys themselves. So I know their families were sort of, I think, I think Drew would... They had a lot of sort of young births in their families and um, the adults for, I suppose, well, I knew that Drew and Charlie's dad, who they didn't see that often, um, he'd sort of, whenever they'd seen him, they'd always, the, the sexual talk and stuff would just be way up, um, exaggerated, like as if he's been showing them stuff. And I think the dad may have showed I don't know for definite, but I think he may have showed Drew porn at some point. I don't know. That's sort of how he used to have it on his phone. Um, it's like we're talking like proper old flip phones, yeah. <laughs> like no data on them or anything. Um, so it was all downloaded videos and he'd just be playing the noises, the sex noises of the women. Um, like, oh, see, that's what you're supposed to sound like. And um, I remember sort of Charlie saying once that his dad had like stuck his finger up the dad had stuck his finger up his own ass and then shoved it in Charlie's his finger in Charlie's face and just stuff like that would happen. So no, I suppose I don't know if that counts as sex. No, um, yes, sex. There's no. I, I'd see. I struggled to see that as like I think because my idea of sexual abuse or my experience of sexual abuse is like full on stuff. But I suppose 
that is definitely that's not normal behavior to do to a kid and that's like incest and sexual yeah. abuse at the same time mm. um, so their dad sort of I think was, was overly sexualized <clears throat> yeah i don't think pushed he'd like, onto them they're now abusing you and your sister and six other yeah young girls who you're aware of yeah and there were others ages. A sort of age seven, six or seven to about, I guess, 15 at the time. And then as they've got older, none older than them, but always sort of between, usually between like 10 and 12, but they'd go a bit older and lower. It's just horrible. Um, like I remember as an adult, I think when my book did come out, which I'm going to redo under my name Nita <laughs> when it originally came out it was in my real name and I bumped into somebody at a bus stop who said he recognized me from he knew who we were growing up but he said I'm so sorry this happened but this happened to my daughter as well by them and they'd gone through the police as well um so, so the that was another did person get involved eventually eventually yeah. um, did you meet any of the victims when you when the abuse was going on um I suppose we'd hang out with one of them, but it was more as we were kids, we were all friends, and then that abuse would happen. And it's like you almost shut it off even at the time and normalize it. But because it was happening to other people, that mm, installed into me even more that, okay, this is normal and this happens to everyone. And it's like, made me think sort of that's what girls are for and that's what boys do. Um, there was a couple more instances like, Sorry, I'm struggling to say it all in order. <laughs> Go for um, the next we used one, to Kelly. hang out on garage roofs that were next to the park. So there was the park we'd hang out at where a lot of stuff happened. A block of flats and garages that were for the flats, but that we'd all hang out on the garage roofs and like build forts and people's back gardens were on the other side of the garage roofs. So we'd like play in the end of the garden that was all overgrown and blocked off and build before and just have fun but drew and james had found it and then trashed it like we'd spent days building this thing and we had like a massive rope swing on the, a like beautiful massive oak tree and because the rope was so high it, the swing would just go so high as kids um but they'd gone and trashed it and abuse used to happen up there sometimes as well um there was like a bed sheet because we'd sort of take like couches and stuff from the bins by the flats to take to our fort to our base and I think you know every, I think every kid has that special place where it's like a den or a fort where they can go to where adults don't know about it but I think because adults didn't know about it all a lot of kids knew about this one it was just a good spot and everyone used to build bases there but um I think Drew and it might have just been Drew this time but he oh yeah James couldn't get up he was too fat to climb up the wall <laughs> to get onto the roof so we'd go on the garage roofs and there was a bed sheet where we'd been i think there was an old sofa bed at the back of one of the gardens so it was we'd taken it for, for that um but he'd sort of covered it over him i can't even remember how we got into this scenario but charlie and me were sort of playing behind the garage roofs in the back gardens of the houses that backed onto them and drew was under a sheet with my twin um you see the sheet obviously going up and down they weren't having full-on sex or anything i think it was like well, i guess dry humping like with clothes on but um then she it's like then she came out and then it was my turn um and drew called me over and he's like it's weird because it's sometimes he'd be so like forceful with words or he always I was always scared of him like I had to do things I felt like I had to but then I've, in between that it would be loads of sort of positive reinforcements like um that most abusers do like he'd never do the usual which is like what other abusers have done to me where oh you're so beautiful oh you you really are amazing whilst they're hurting you so I really struggle being called beautiful or pretty or anything along those lines um because it feels like that's just what people say before they hurt you um but i remember being under the sheet and him um sort of anal basically it didn't go in properly but it was proper he was touching me it wasn't no clothes or anything and it was under the sheet 
and I remember him saying, oh, your sister never let me do this. Like, it's disgusting. Um, mm. But then that made me feel like I'd let him do it. And I think at that age, there was no, um, like, too young to consent legally. So, you know, so if you didn't say no, then it wasn't rape. Um, even if you're 10. <laughs> um, so that happened. And then we heard laughing from outside, like someone had come out of the flats that were by the garages. So not the garden side, but the, the side with the flats. And I went out from under the sheet and it was two adults, I think just a couple in their 30s with kids. And they would saw the sheet, they'd seen the sheet going up and down, saw me come out. Obviously I was upset. Um, but they just laughed um, and walked off. So, what's wrong with these adults? <sighs> I think it's a bit of a different time where it's not so recognised. It's more oh, look, like it's. I think it nowadays, if you saw, I suppose any kids doing anything like that, it would be that's that's not on. Is this consensual? But consent wasn't really talked about. I guess back then it was like. It, it was like rape is full on intercourse and that's it and anything below that it's not. And even if you don't say no, then it's not rape. And I didn't know that word by then because we hadn't even done sort of sex education in school yet. But um, so it was a couple of things happened, like it would be the garages or the park or like the swimming pool. A similar nature. Yeah. And then there was this one time that was, I remember it was the last time that I sort of let them do this to me. Um, and they'd be doing it to my twin the whole time as well among all these other girls um i'd gone to meet charlie to get ritalin um to carry on losing weight for judo and i think i'd got to the park with him but his brother drew had followed him there and it's sort of dark by this point i can't remember if it was dark or not actually but i remember it, it was evening it was up way after school but there was no one else in the park um um, I don't want to say too much because there's still sort of kind of pending legal stuff, but not. Um, but James was with him. Um, he's just not just on this event, but at other times there was like a hill at the back of the park and James would often, it's like Drew would take and James would take me and make me do stuff there. Like just like, hand jobs and he'd touch me and I never kissed though I remember him saying like not pin me to the wall but his arm was sort of up on the wall and I'm against the wall with no notes couldn't get away from it but he's not actually touching me um sort of physically um apart from like the sexual stuff but I remember him trying to kiss me and I pulled away and he's like oh do you not like kissing and oh you don't like kissing much do you I was like no and it was like that was like one thing that they couldn't do that that I guess I could feel like was my choice. Um, that went on to a full on rate, basically. It didn't go in. Po Sorry. <laughs> so it's from here to here. Yeah. Um, that went on to a full on rape, the incident where it was sort of the last time that I saw them. It was a couple of weeks before my 11th birthday. Mm. And I'd gone on my own stupidly without my twin, but I'm kind of glad because at least she wasn't there. Um, I was year six at school, so after it, I remember we just started sex education at school, and I thought all sex makes a baby, and I didn't. It hadn't gone in properly, hadn't broke my hymen or anything, but it was bleeding at the front, and he um, finished um, where he didn't usually at other times. But um, I remember thinking at that age, all sex makes a baby, and so I thought. Oh, shit I might be pregnant what do I do 10 years old and I had a judo competition the next day or it was one of the days after and I just remembered right what are you not allowed to do when you're pregnant what kills the baby like, drink drugs I'll do whatever I can so I took loads of um I think it was it would have been ibuprofen or paracetamol all the ritalin I had and um might have even been some alcohol maybe a beer or something but mainly pills and all the Ritalin and so speed overdose with paracetamol, loads of it, um, at least a whole sheet of maybe 28 pills. Um, and it obviously made me throw up. 
but not till the middle of the night. Um, and I remember when I'd first got in from after the like rape happened, um, I remember having a bath and just trying to get clean because you just feel like you can never be clean again. And as another one, I know I've been told like if, if and when it happens to not have a bath because that's how you get rid of the evidence, I guess. Um, even though I hadn't gone in properly, it like hurt something because I was bleeding a little bit. Um, but I remember I had a bath um, and just cried in the bath, and I didn't. And I, I think I either chucked my clothes away or put them straight in the washing machine, uh, um, or it might have been painting up soda. Or I can't remember. Like we used to go swimming in lakes sometimes, so I might have gone in like wet all my clothes to lie and say that that's why there's. It's not blood, it's dirt, you know, because it was blood on my bottom, whatever trousers I was wearing at the time. Um, so it's like two in the morning, I guess now, I've overdosed to try and get rid of, kill the chance of pregnancy from rape. And um, I thought like, fuck it, it's not worth the pills and Charlie's friendship. He was my best friend, it felt at the time, but it wasn't worth that. I couldn't have that anymore. And because we'd started learning about sex education, I'd started realizing like it was sex and sort of what was happening. Um, the I think we had a judo competition the next day, so I'd been throwing up all night. I think obviously the, the speed or the Ritalin would have <laughs> kept me buzzing all night. And I still got up and went to this judo competition the next day. And I think my mum says as an adult, like she remembers it. She remembers that day and I couldn't, I think I was about to fight and I threw up everywhere. Oh. Just gone white as a ghost, threw up um, on the floor, <laughs> like right by the judo mat and freaked all the adults out. And like the smell made another kid sick. So they thought there was like a bug going around. <laughs> um, you know, that really painful burning bile sick cause you've got no food to like, mm. Yeah, and my heart was doing weird shit, I think because of the drugs, but I didn't, yeah. I'd started be having, I suppose, anxiety episodes at the time, so it felt kind of normal for me, but I didn't have to fight. <laughs> um, so I, I think, oh fuck. We can block names out. So I didn't have to fight. Um, I think my twin went on and might've won a medal that time. Um, so it was nice to see the, my twin kind of just have a bit of praise and um, achievement that's just hers that day because it's it's hard as a twin like having nothing for yourself and it's always having to compete and be better than the other one but my parents were very very aware of making sure we both felt equally praised equally loved there was never any special treatment and like if one of us had won something or was having a really good day and the other one hadn't, they'd make sure to give the, the other one lots of praise as well. So we both knew. So like we were both just happy and loved. Like my parents, I've got mad respect for them. They're amazing. And uh, um, despite all the shit I caused them sort of as a teenager because of <laughs> the abuse and that, um, yeah, I wouldn't trade them for the world. And I'm really lucky. Mm. Um, I think after that main sort of, incident happened um i stopped going to the park i don't think i stepped foot in that park till way older actually but um so the sexual abuse had stopped but the bullying had got way worse with james and drew because they were james kind of disappeared off at this point um but drew he was friends with i think they were all in year 10 at school um we were still year six and one of his friends who we'd hung out with briefly, she was one of the girls who was being abused by him. Um, I think she'd, I think she'd sort of, she's one of the girls that would get all the boys and it was quite, it wasn't uncommon to call someone a slag at that age. So mm. um, I think me being a kid and still like 11 or 10, I didn't understand how much how sort of offensive it was to call someone that so like i knew it was a bad one not to say it to someone's face but um i was with a mutual friend who was a bit older and 
he's like, oh, I know so and so, and I was like, oh yeah, and he's like, oh, apparently they're with, apparently they have got like two, three boyfriends, and I was like, oh yeah, no, I heard they're a bit of a slag, but like, as in, I'm still friends with her, not in a bad way, just I was too honest as a kid, um, a lot of the time. When um, I was younger, the slag was thrown around <laughs> a lot. I didn't think yeah. it was that bad, so Obviously but he. Nowadays it's- yeah, different. It's been brought to light how, <laughs> yeah. I guess I say full and there wasn't, it didn't go in properly, but it was, t- uh, it was still enough to bleed. And after that, I think that's when I started getting depressed, quit judo, um, stopped trying at school. Um, I'd had a fight by this point with an older kid, so... 11 at this point the abuse has just stopped finished but the bullying started so I wasn't being abused sexually by Drew anymore or James but they'd started bullying us and getting everybody all of the kids their age and our age to just hate me and my twin and there was about a three-month period where I'd walk I had to walk past this the girl the girl who'd been also abused by Drew but was friends with him because she was his age I had to walk past her house to get to school, so to and from school. And oftentimes there'd be 15, 20 kids from age 14 up to even 18, honestly, like on mopeds. And I had like boiling hot water out of a kettle thrown at me out the the window of the flat. Like it didn't hit me more than splashes, luckily. Um, I was physically, I guess it counts as physical assault now, but I was sort of grabbed by the throat and threatened with a knife by... Um, an 18 year old on a moped and I was 11 at this time and that was all mainly because the person I talked to about the slag word um, not knowing that it's really that you can't call someone that and still be their friend after like he'd gone the person I told that had gone to the girl and it's she thought I was bitching about her. I don't know, probably rightly, wrongly. <laughs> um, that's why she started hating me. But then Drew had got all of their friends to hate me. And yeah, I had like boiling water thrown at me. This is every day after school. Um, shouts constantly. They'd shout at me. They'd pull my hair um, and just shout, calorie freaks, like um, calorie freaks, judo freaks, ugly, they'd call me ugly, call me fat, even though I still weighed six stone and I was probably five foot two by then. So um, I remember one day I just had enough and I couldn't do it anymore. I was crying every single day after school, crying at school sometimes. I'd just break down and cry. And um, I was walking home from school and she's there with all with Drew and I think James would have been there as well and all their 15, 14-year-old friends who were in year 10 and 11 at school and I was there year six in my little junior school uniform and I was said in front of everybody I just called her out and said I'm sick of this shit fight me tomorrow at the park come on like I'm sick of your shit like fight me tomorrow and I know she couldn't back down because everyone had heard it (laughs) so next day I I told my mum and dad I was gonna have a fight because they'd seen her bullying me um so obviously they don't condone (laughs) fighting but they knew she'd been hurt I mean I suppose for thought that that would be the end, end of it um so I'm 11 at this point junior school I've gone to school I remember it was sats week that's why I went in the day after because even with like after all that um emotion and stuff so I'd gone to school that day like couldn't concentrate on anything and I didn't really tell anybody my age because well it was all kids from the high school I didn't not, I wasn't really friends with any of them and they didn't like me anyway so I didn't tell anyone at school but as soon as the bell rang like three o'clock or whatever time it would have finished I went straight to the park in my junior school uniform I think I tied my hair back like <laughs> shitting myself honestly <laughs> but um, I got there expecting about maybe 10 kids to be there honest to god that park I got into the park there must have been 50 kids there all with high school uniforms, some on mopeds. So they like, how old do you have to be to drive a moped? Like these were big 16. kids. <laughs> um, and like, I thought they'd all be bullying me or all hating me like everyone 
like I thought they were all her friends, but they weren't. They were, a lot of them were just people were there to watch a fight. So I'd got there and I'm getting a round of applause. Like, yay, go on then. Like, <laughs> at um, this point, you're thinking your judo skills might yeah, like, come win the day. It. Yeah, oh my, it was just like, <laughs> um, it felt like walking into like a boxing ring. <laughs> um, so I got to there. I think she was, I got walked into the park and everyone's sort of crowding around with their little Nokia flip phones. <laughs> Um, this would have been like 2006 so can you imagine like the picture quality um i think there was someone filming it was where that had just started it was just starting that things were being filmed and sort of shown everywhere um <laughs> but i've got in there and walked up to the swings and she was sitting on the swings um she was didn't seem as mouthy as she as she was all the time um and I think she said, like, well, I'm not going to hit you. You hit me first. So um, I thought about backing down. But there was all these kids there. And I didn't want to call her out and then back down. Because even at that age, I knew, like, that's just going to open me up to bullying for everybody. Um, it's a bit of dirty fighting. But I went up behind her. I got her in a head. So I thought I was going to choke her out. So I, I walked. Like, she could still see me. Like, I didn't just sneak up behind her. I walked in front of her and then behind as if I was going to walk off. So I grabbed her behind doing a headlock where you, like, um, lock and... <laughs> like a proper one. <laughs> um, a judo one? Yeah. <laughs> Is it called the figure of four? Oh, I can't remember, but it, I think it might have been a jiu-jitsu one. <laughs> but, um, you know, you kind of arm around the neck and then you lock mm. your arm after so that... I tried to do one of those, but she'd like, I think, because she was still sitting on the swing at this point, she'd pulled me over her head. Um, so I grabbed on her hair, um, ended up on the floor. I think she was choking me at one point by my hood, so my sister kind of booted her in the head and then everyone's pulled about. Like, no, one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but I think because we were so young, we were like, we were 11 and she was 15. Um, I think she only got a couple slaps in, but I remember pinning her on the floor and after my sister had kicked her, I think I, I managed to get on top. It was more, this is ground fighting. Got on top of her. And obviously judo, you don't fight, you don't punch or hit. So that wasn't a natural thing for me. So I'd got her in like a judo hold and then um, the kids are shouting like, oh, one hit her. Like, it's boring now. And like, these, I thought they were her friends but they were obviously just there for a fight. And when I told my older sister, my dad the day before, like, yeah, I'm going to have a fight tomorrow, just so you know. <laughs> um my sister said, like, because I explained to her about the bullying and I said, my older sister, I'd said, yeah, she's been bullying me for months. And she's like, how, when you win, you should get her on the floor and make her say sorry. So I did that. I slapped her, must have been 20 slaps, really hard slaps on her face. Um, and then pinned her down and made her say sorry. <laughs> and she thought, I'm sorry. Like, and, but even, even though she'd hurt me so much, like, I didn't, I hated the feeling of hitting her while she was on the floor. It was like, so I just, I had enough and I was only sort of pinned her to kind of I guess restrain her so she couldn't hit me and then when she stopped kicking off I let her up um and I think the kids were all like booing because it's like no like come on round two <laughs> and like some of the parents had come out from the houses that backed onto the park um like oh I've called the police they're coming like look at you girls behaving like bloody animals like it was pretty bad but um so I left and um, so we went then, um, like feeling happy that obviously I, di I didn't, I couldn't, I can't punch someone when they're down despite how much they've hurt me. But I felt a, like a sense of achievement, like maybe it, the bullying will stop now. Everyone's sort of seen that fight. And then I was getting high fives off like random older teenagers for like about a month after, honestly. <laughs> like, oh, that's that girl who beat up so-and-so, legend. <laughs> and so that like, <laughs> um, that happened at induction day then. So, you know, when you're in your junior school, you go for an induction day for high school and like the naughtiest looking kids from like years the highest years like hey that i know you legend uh, and all in front of the teachers they're like yeah that's that girl who beat up so and so and i was i didn't it wasn't like that but <laughs> um so that kind of i guess started a bad reputation at that school and made me feel wanted i guess by the friends or by not not hated and not a bully target so that made me associate being naughty with not being bullied um, but just back to the fight the day after, 
um, I went into school because it was Sats week and the day on the, the day of the fight, I was so kind of disorientated by the whole thing that I'd left my bag in the park. So when we'd gone back to go and get it later in the evening, um, I'd, my pencil case had been stolen and it was Sats week. So, um, so my dad took us to the shop to buy like a brand new pencil case. <laughs> I don't know where he found this pencil case, but it said tough on it. And he's like, here you go, it's one for you. Mm -hmm. Um, Hope you're enjoying the podcast. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. <laughs> know what that sound means? It's more sales being racked up on Shopify. What do you think of Shopify, Jen? I absolutely love Shopify, the all-in-one commerce platform to sell, grow, and make money for your business. Have you used it to boost your business? 100%, <laughs> yeah. So Shopify makes it simple for anyone to sell from anywhere in the world. From creating your online shop in your own look, to finding new customers, to scaling your burning idea. You can do it all from one place. With no need for skills in design or coding. It's how every minute of every day, a new seller makes their first sale with Shopify and you can join them. So what is your favourite UK-based business that's found success with Shopify? It's got to be Gymshark. They have grown massively thanks to Shopify. Now it's your turn to start selling today with Shopify for free. And thanks to 24-7 support, Shopify is there to help you every step of the way. Sign up for a free 14-day trial at shopify.co.uk slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Go to shopify.co.uk slash Sean right now to grow your business today. So that's shopify.co.uk forward slash Sean, S-H-A-U-N. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. And all I had was like one scratch on this side and a little graze on that side, I think, from her nails. But um, so I've bought this new pencil case, new school stuff. Got back home. I think her mum had turned up at my house with her mum having a go at my mum saying that like when her kid had told her, yeah, I'm going to have a fight. She, The mum had been saying, no, you're not fighting an 11 year old like you're 15. And the mum was kicking off at my mum saying like, are we allowed to swear? Yeah. <laughs> so like fucking hell. Like when, um, I told her not to fight an eleven year old, but I didn't think. Um, yeah, I didn't know it was going to be like an eleven year old that could fight, basically, in other words. And I think she'd bought either bought her her kid or a picture of her face. Like, look what she's look what your kid's done to my kid. Um, I don't think I'd broken her nose, but it was quite bad, and I'd busted a lip, and she had a black eye and nosebleed and lip and. The next day, I think she'd gone into school and all the kids were like passing this video of the fight around. And obviously we're all in our school uniform. So you had that stupid rule of, oh, you're in your school uniform. So you're, it's still the school's responsibility and you can still get in trouble. But I remember getting, I went into school because it was Sats week and that's like the big exams at the end of junior school. Um, so that's why I'd gone in. Otherwise I would have probably just took the day off. <laughs> um, but went into school as soon as I got into the class. I think I got asked to go to the head teacher's office. I'm thinking, oh shit! Like, um, but I got in there and I had like grays on this side, um, a scratch on one side and grays on the other side. But that's it. And as soon as I got in, the kids who usually bully me were like, oh, I think the kids who usually bully me, um, and thought I was the most uncalled loser person in the world, not worth talking to. They were coming up to me saying, oh my, oh, um did you fight so and so my older brother was at that fight i've saw the video like nice one and like <laughs> um so i felt kind of accepted by them after that a lot of their older siblings had been there was quite a few kids in my year at junior school whose older brothers and sisters had been at the fight um but so i've been called into the office went to the head teacher's office the head teacher and deputy heads there i think i'd been in trouble a couple times but i'd mainly get in trouble outside school and like maybe the police would come into school and have a bit of a whinge or look for me some days at junior school but I'd never really get in trouble in school so they'd call me into the office I will explain <laughs> um but they called me into the office and I was thinking oh shit I'm gonna be in so much trouble but um they were just asked if I was okay they said the head teacher at the high school had called the, our head teacher at the junior school to explain that like one of our pupils had a fight with one of yours and I think because of the age difference that's why they were so kind of asking if I was okay and I thought I'm going to be in trouble and they were like no we're just asking are you okay um yeah and not just physically but they would I think asking what was going on mentally and that was like 
So the first time an adult had asked if I was okay. God, out of all the stuff I've talked to, that's a bit of cry about. <laughs> um, so yeah, the bu- the bullying from them lot stopped after that, and Drew didn't have so much a hold over all these older kids because they'd seen me stand up for myself. And I ended up back friends with the girl I'd had a fight with, staying around the house on a sleepover like two weeks later. <laughs> 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 and saying sorry and hugging it out and being friends after that. And she stopped being friends with the abuser. So her abuse stopped too. Um, How did it come about? You found out about her being abused. Did she tell you? It was more we didn't talk about it as abuse, but she would said we were talking about sort of sexual stuff like oh what if have you done this with a boy have you ever had a boyfriend i think it was just me and her at some point and she said that she'd done stuff with drew and i was like oh i have too yeah um and she's like what well, uh, when i was oh it was ages ago and she's like well how old and i was like well he was about 13 and she's like gross you that means you would have been eight or nine then that's disgusting so then i thought like that's sort of the third time an adult or an older kid I've tried to tell and they've made kind of reacted in a way that's made me feel like I'm in the wrong. Um, but it was more than she, he, he'd send her like videos of him sort of masturbating and then she'd show us like, not in a, I guess not in an abusive way, but just like, Oh, look what he sent me. And then we, I'd just, Haha, like kind of laugh about it, but not know how to react. Um, that affected me a lot. I think growing up, as getting older, and I think when I was at 15 and 16 years old, being at sort of parties with other kids that age, or sort of most people are just having sex for the first time and doing all that kind of stuff, and it's the big kind of exciting thing, I suppose, for that age. But when whenever someone would show me porn at that age, I just wouldn't know how to react. So I'd like, if I was with other people, it would be okay because I could wait and wait for their reaction and just copy it. But I really struggled. <laughs> I remember this one time... I was at a party and I was about 15 or 16, maybe 15. And one of the older guys had, had this picture. It was a porn picture of just a guy with a massive, <laughs> massive dick. And um, like I, th- I think it was fake. I don't know. But they were just show. He was the person with the picture was showing everyone at the party just individually and getting their reactions. Um, but I was one of the first, I was the first girl to be shown it. So I didn't, I hadn't. I didn't have any behaviours to copy off other girls because I wasn't sort of out as sort of bi or anything or curious in my sexuality then. So um, I looked at it and I was like, uh, look at the belly on it, like, because he had a belly. And they're like, wait, that's what you see and that's what you say at that picture. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it was like showing a naked picture and then saying, oh, look at the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> but I, I think going when the abuse kind of stopped there'd be lots of other incidences from random adults or random people where it wasn't like a full-on nothing you could physically pin and say happened but just stuff that that on its own isn't crossing a line but when you put it all together it is abuse how did they come into your life um one was a school teacher it only happened once (laughs) Um, and the other time was uh, a, a boxing coach, but not um, the boxing club I went to when I'm older. Like, um, but not a coach. It was someone who was working on reception. But I was about eleven at this time, or twelve maybe, um, wearing a full tracksuit, like nothing girly. So after the abuse, I start. I stopped dressing any. I think when the abuse started, to be honest, about nine, I stopped wearing girl clothes. I would just wear a full tracksuit. Um, I'd strap my boobs up when I started growing boobs at like 12. I'd strap them up. I guess it's called binding. Yeah. Now I'd do that to just try and look like a boy. And I'd just scrape my hair back in a low ponytail with a hat on always. <laughs> um, so to just never, ever look sexually attractive. attractive. Yeah. Um, no makeup ever. <laughs> um, but I think we'd gone to boxing. We were getting in there for free. And like, the, yeah, the coach was chill. He'd like, let us go use the gym for free and join in on some classes, but mainly just hang out at the boxing gym all day. So we did that for like a month. It was like my new thing that I was going to do that week. <laughs> um, so, and after I'd quit judo, it was nice to have that kind of, be in that kind of environment of like competitive and positive and just being fit and healthy and being 
um, working out and hanging out with other people with that interest. Um, so we'd go to the boxing club, but there was this one time it was the it was daytime and we'd gone to hang out. It was near Christmas. I remember we'd gone to bring the boxing coach a box of chocolates because that we'd all saved up together with a little pound each <laughs> to say thank you for letting us use the gym for free. Um, but nothing's free, is it? <laughs> but it wasn't from him that, and I wouldn't even call it abuse because it was only a couple, it's mainly passing comments. So I guess maybe harassment at the most, but this sounds really gross and you'd never get away with this now or they would never get away with this now. But when you book into this boxing club, in the office where the the man would sit, he was sort of in his 60s, just big old beer gut. And he'd, he'd say hello to us. He didn't seem that shitty, but I, I'm dressed like a boy in full track suit, no makeup, nothing. And in the back of this tiny little office that he's sitting in as we're going to sort of just where people book in. And it's me, my twin and Charlie, because we, I think this must have been just as the abuse had finished and we're still seeing him a little bit. Or, but only on his own. Um, we've gone in and the guy sat in the ticket office, he's like in his 60s, who was a coach. Um, there's like a poster on the wall of just a naked girl in like a Brazilian bikini thong with her boobs out. Um, just really nasty porn, or well, just really typical porn pose. and But nasty for a kid to see and it was in it was just behind him in the office like you could see it really clearly from walking past and my friends um charlie's like hey, look and i'm just like hey. and then the boxing coach or no, i don't think he was a coach but the ticket man in his 60s um he, he just points at the pitch goes oh. Sorry, I'll take it out. <laughs> the guy's in his 60s and sitting in the office um he just points at the picture and goes oh need to look good in a picture like that and <laughs> I was just like I didn't know how to react but I just felt really gross because it's just the fact that he was looking at me and thinking like that about me like that and I was 11 or 12 oh, fucking pervert yeah um but I think we'd also at that age we had older male friends that would buy us alcohol and then we'd hang out with them can we go back to the school sorry. teacher? Sorry. Yes, that happened. Um, it was only like a one-off. Um, I actually bumped into somebody recently who was in my class when this happened, and he said he remembered it as well. Um, so it's I know when you remember things, it can get muddled up, and you always remember the good better than it was, and sometimes the, like it gets mixed up. But I was year seven, gone to high school, and... I suppose not so much being annoyed. I had started being like misbehaving at school, but um, one of the things they were really tight on at school was the uniform, having to have your top button done up. But I think because of everything I'd been through, I just felt claustrophobic as fuck with anything like that on my chest. So what I'd do is I'd get, I would wear like a, I don't know, 28 inch collared shirt. I'd buy like a 50 inch men's shirt, cut the collar off and sew it to like a 28 inch shirt so i do the top button up but it would still be like way down here <laughs> <laughs> um but i did that and came in and this was this was a teacher that knew i'd always have my top button undone that was like one thing he'd have to tell me off for at the start of the lesson i've gone into the lesson there's a whole classroom full of us you all like every, the whole the whole class full of kids i wasn't on my own and this um big male teacher he was like i suppose 50s or 60s Good, like six foot two, quite a big bloke. Um, but like when I'm like 12, and he asked me to do my top button up. I'm like, oh no, look, so it is. And um, he's like, oh, that collar looks ridiculous. I could get my whole hand down there and stuck his hand down my top. And I was pushing his hand away, but his hand was so big, it covered both of my boobs. <laughs> um, like he didn't do any grabbing action, but it physically touched down there. Um, and both of my hands wouldn't even go around his wrist trying to push him away. Like that's sort of how big he was and how young I was. Um, but then he pushed it away. Um, he obviously let go after only a few seconds, but everyone was just like, oh my God. Like the kids couldn't believe that just happened. And did, obviously, it, did it get reported? No. Um, everyone was just kind of weirded out. And then I think when I just started laughing like scream laughing to just kind of lighten the mood and not feel awkward and i guess i'd learned that that was normal 
So, yeah, no, no kids reported it, but I bumped into at least one person who was in that class, and I said to him, I only started telling it, I telling the story, and I said, "Oh my God, do you remember? Do you remember that time with my collar was really big?" And he goes, "Oh, and the teacher did this, like this, and just said it word for word almost." Um, and I don't think that's even in my like my book, so there's no way that the kid could have known that unless apart from like that obviously did happen stuck in his memory mm. you, you, you were about to say that um some older Who people were buying your booze <laughs> yeah so um after the abuse finished and we sort of started high school obviously the ritalin had had to stop and i was still trying to lose weight for judo um until we quit that and then i, I still I still couldn't bring myself to allow myself to eat anytime I was hungry, but I was trying to starve myself to lose weight, but then I just couldn't stick to it. So I was still looking for another drug or just something to stop me being hungry. So I tried weed a couple of times. This is at um, still 11, moving on to 12 years old and I'd started drinking, but it's quite hard to get alcohol at that age, I guess, um, without having older friends. So, um, I think I'd get served in one shop for a while. I'd just like put socks in my bra to pretend I had boobs and makeup on and pretend to be having like adult conversations on the phone. Like, <laughs> gotta go, babe, the kids are in the car. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, gotta, I'm on my lunch break. Like, <laughs> just like <laughs> adult sentences um, to get served. But that would stop fairly quickly. Like they click on to, that, to the fact that we were all kids. So we'd hang out with some older friends and it would usually be like someone that's like a known <laughs> pervert or like a known rapist um but they'd buy us alcohol when we'd sit with them um and i just wanted to say like not every adult that we'd hang out with was like that i think we had one adult friend that it sounds really weird on the surface like a 50 odd year old man hanging out with sort of 13 year old girls but he'd never ever try it on with us this one he just and he was um i think he had special needs learning difficulties so i think mentally he's like a like a young teenager so it was like we were around the same age um emotionally and i think he'd talk about his relationship problems with his missus and he'd talk about like sex but not in a way that included us it wasn't about us or advanced to us it was just about him and his girlfriend in a way of like almost asking for advice like just how you'd ask friends your own age oh what should i do i want to do this but they um what well, yeah just sort of asking us for advice and but my mum and dad found out that we were hanging out with this person my dad went mental and my twin at one point had gone off to the woods with this adult friend who's in his 50s and she we were 13 at the time and they sent a police helicopter out looking for him because my dad had obviously called the police like yeah they've gone off no one's heard from her for a couple hours um but my sister says she walked out the woods and um walked out the woods with our older friend and there was about five police cars the helicopter had been circling but um i think she just took a big breath and or he took a big breath and she's like it's all right you like you won't be in trouble like you've not done anything wrong i'll tell them we were just talking um but i think mum and dad obviously had a go at us because it was like oh how can you be so stupid what do you expect is going to happen um i hated how at that age you're always told or what i thought we were always told oh boys only want one thing and it's like you're told it as if it's this big secret or as if you're too stupid to know what it is and after it already happened i felt like well i know what they want it's already happened like it's almost I don't know. Um, kind of like lost what I was trying to say. <laughs> no problem. So you were hanging around with. There was one nice. Yeah. Free shot. Uh, let's talk about the other ones. Um. <clears throat> I mean, were they around the same sort of age? Um, these older men. Um. I said that most of them were fairly young. I say thirties, mid thirties, and they're hanging around thirteen-year-old girls, buying them booze, inviting them back to their house to sit with them. Yeah, so we'd never go back to the older one's house, um, but we'd go and there was like a secret garden in a graveyard um, that we'd all go and drink at. Um, but the, I suppose the known rapist, that wasn't until I was 15 with a friend. 
But um, I'm going to try to do this in order. But um, yeah, he'd buy us alcohol and we'd always hang out in twos because we knew that he'd been done for rape. And it's so stupid looking back now because um, the states we'd get in around him. But I think I was so depressed at the time and my friend was as well um that you just don't care because it's just like well they're gonna you know people are gonna do it anyway so almost letting them or just not caring because you're that de depressed that you're just out of your body so it's, it's just a body doesn't matter if i get beaten or raped like it's not my i'm i'm just my i'm i'm somewhere else can we and talk about the it. first time he did rape you so this friend didn't rape me but he raped my friend who was also female my age um this rapist who'd buy us alcohol and some of our other friends were still hanging out with him after this happened and they knew but i think when you do get raped the only thing that's in your control is whether you go to the police or not so i always respected her decision not to tell even though it was hard and i think she called me after it just happened and like she still obviously had his dna evidence all over her um i went to I think I went to get a morning after pill with her the next day, but didn't without telling, or I might have even lied and said it was for me and then gummed it and taken it for her because they would have checked her out and they would have known. But it's so important to still have that choice and have it not taken away from you um, after going through an assault or sexual abuse. Um, I think mine was taken out of my hands, my choice, the first time. Um, so... So yeah, let's go back to when you were 13. Okay, so I say it's 12 to 13. Um, 13 started started hanging out with older friends that could buy us alcohol. And most of the time they just want like, they just want a kiss or not at all. They just want company, I guess, to hang around with them. And wouldn't try it on until we were super drunk, but often we'd leave before that point and we'd sort of just use them to get the alcohol and then go or hang out with them for like an hour and then go um trying not to be too drunk around them because i was still very aware of why they were there it wasn't even at sort of 12 13 it, i always knew that nothing's really free and that that's it felt like that's all most men if not all want um there was one incident when i was 12 where we, we used to stand outside the shop asking people to go in and buy us alcohol <laughs> Um, and this, this sort of man in his sixties looked quite rough. He looked like an alcoholic, um, without being judgmental and trying to say what, what an alcoholic looks like. But he was just sort of a typical, he just looked like he wasn't doing that great. Um, and yeah, he was willing to go in and buy us alcohol. So we gave him some money and I think we used to save up our, lunch money at school so we'd get two pound a day <laughs> for school dinners um so that's 10 pounds a week so we'd all save we'd all save it and just skip lunch at school and then everyone would chip in at the weekend and have enough money to buy alcohol um so usually it would take ages like at least an hour or so to get someone that was willing to go in for us and occasionally um we'd ask someone that happened to be like police off duty and stuff so um had to get good at running <laughs> um but this man had gone in for us he'd bought us alcohol but then he'd got out he was out of the shop we'd walked around a corner but we'd have to go to like a like an alleyway corner where there was no other people around for him to give us this alcohol where that obviously left me in this alleyway with this weird old man that we just met um, well, I say old as everyone's old when you're <laughs> when you're that age, but um, he's probably mid sixties. Um, he bought us the alcohol, but it, I went to grab it, and he he just held the bag. He did, wouldn't give it to me. He's like, oh, give us a kiss then. It's like, oh, for fuck's sake! And my friends going, oh, you do. It. I was like, oh, I was like, oh, you do. It. So my friends and they were like, oh, well, he wants you, mate. Like, so I just kissed him, just a peck, and then took the alcohol, and that was. I was still twelve then. It was just gross. Disgusting. <laughs> um, that sort of... It was like another tick, if you like, of proof, I guess, for me that it was my fault or my choice, all the abuse. Um, I had some fun times, though, because of all the shit that happened to us when we were kids. Like, 
it made me naughty and being naughty was fun like we'd go and have awesome days out we'd like stay out all night and like sneak out and be on the run from the police and keep them on like four hour foot chases and sleep out in a field and just wake up or like lying under the stars under a summer sky with your friends and everyone had equally fucked up lives and equally dysfunctional families and mental health undiagnosed and often abuse that um we'd only sort of started talking about with each other at about 14 15 but um so I'd drink sort of whenever I could get it but it wouldn't be that often at sort of 12 13 but the abuse had stopped now that abuse by James and Drew but we'd still bump into them one of them um I think went to sixth form at our school for a little bit so we'd still have to walk past them most days um and sometimes they'd catch us out there they'd be out with their friends while we'd be out drinking on the same state and it would be a fight one of them one of drew's friends physically squared up to me and they had this other friend who just always hated me and i never knew why and he was the older brother of someone we'd hang out with um when we were about 14 at this point and it was only when i got older I didn't know, but that was James. And I just didn't recognize him because he'd, he'd got older, grown a beard, changed his hair, lost loads of weight. And that would be why he hated me because he'd done all that to me. Um, I think I was still getting bullied a bit in school, but I was acting like it didn't affect me. So almost every single group at school, you know, everyone splits off. They'd be like the cool kids, um, like the really smart kids um the goth kids that we have all these little groups every single one of them almost would say hi to me if not all of them but I never had that one group that was mine that I could permanently hang out with so it's like everyone would say hi but not much more than that and I just sort of never really had a friend um and I used to really really resent and en envy people kids whose parents were friends which automatically meant they were friends with the parents kid with the friends with the parents friends kids because it was like, well, no matter what they did, they're still going to be friends. Whereas I felt like I had to really try and put in so much effort to be friends and then still not really get very far. Um, when I was, <clears throat> when I was 12, I think, I think I was 12. Um, so I'm in junior school. I think I'd started drinking, but not that often. Um, I started getting a pain, just a random pain in my stomach and I didn't know why. Um, and it went away off, um, for a whole month and then came back. And obviously I hadn't started um, my period at that time. So I didn't know what how painful that's supposed to be. And with judo, any injury, like if I broke my toe once, broke my toe in a fight and I just strapped it to the other one and carried on fighting. It's, so I was taught that there was a reward from pain. So I had such a high pain tolerance as a kid. I think I had a, like a tooth pulled out without anesthetic. And my mum said I just tensed my finger up a bit when they pulled it and that was it. <laughs> um so I I had a really high pain tolerance so I just dealt with this pain and it hurt when I used my ab muscles so like even when I think I was on a swing and I noticed it hurting when I got high so I just let the swing slow down and just sat with my stomach and I didn't know what period pain felt like so I think it was probably period pains but obviously nothing it hadn't started yet so went away for after about a week it went away for a month I was quite swollen but then a month later, the pain came back 10 times worse. And my stomach was really distended, my abdomen, my lower abs. And um, I think I told my mum, but I was supposed to be in the naughty room at school. So I was like internal suspension, uh, internally suspended where you're in that room with like boards up in between the chairs. Um, almost like solitary confinement, but at school when you sit there for seven hours doing nothing, not allowed to talk to anyone, not allowed to move. I've sounds like abuse now looking back but I was supposed to be in that room for the day the day that this pain got really bad so I think everyone thought I was faking um so I think my mum took me to the doctors and they had a look at my stomach and, and um, called asked to call an ambulance this um because I couldn't even lift my legs up I had, had to well, I think my mum had to help me get up onto the bed at the doctor's surgery for them to examine me and I still hadn't had a period yet so I didn't know if it was that pain um, but it was rock solid, my lower abs, just this whole part of my belly was rock solid and really, really hurt. And um, so I've gone to the doctors, they seemed a bit worried about it. So they sent us straight to the hospital, um, but I didn't want an ambulance because I was still, 
um, under the impression that just pain, I say subconsciously that pain's a reward and um, you're weak if you sort of say that you are in pain. Um, that's how I felt. Um, so went to hospital. I think we sit around for hours. I remember my mum saying a joke that like, oh, I wish you had called an ambulance. Like we might've got here quicker. But I remember the pain had got really a lot worse just in those few hours even. And anytime we went over a bump in the car, I was just like screaming and crying in agony. And I had to be wheelchaired in the hospital. I couldn't even um, like stand up or walk or hardly talk. Um, and they did a scan and they said that my womb, which is supposed to be a triangle and like about this size, was this size and the blue balloon shape filled up with blood. Um, where I thought I was worried that because I was still like 12 or 13, I thought, well, all sex makes a baby. Maybe when I was raped, maybe I did get pregnant and the drugs killed it, but didn't get rid of the miscarriage. So I thought that maybe this dead child's been inside me and is trying to come out now and everyone's going to find out that I'm a disgusting kid and have done all this. So that's probably why I pushed up hospital for so long, but they did this scan and it was the scan they use on a pregnancy the ultrasound Absolutely. with the gel and um the nurse woman when we went in there to do the scan she um she just pulled my without warning she's like okay so I need you to lift your top up but and then without warning just pulled my trousers and underwear down I was like woo um like and it just reminded me I had it was my first flashback that I remember having my first post-traumatic stress disorder flashback of the rape and I just thought like fuck this I don't want to be here and um and not like suicide away but just like at the doctors um at the hospital um but she did the scans found out it's infected blood we need to do surgery or you're going to lose your womb basically so um they did a surgery and they it's called an imperfect hymen I don't know I remember it and it's where your hymen is supposed to break when you start your period as a girl um your hymen it's like a line of body tissue um, that's supposed to break for the blood to come through. And it's the same line of body tissue that breaks the first time someone has penetrative sex. Um, but I think because I'd been raped, there was, but not enough to go in, there was scar tissue around it. They said, oh, it's thicker than it should be, which is scar tissue. So mine hadn't broken. So the blood had traveled back up into my womb oh. and I had two months of, two months periods worth of blood oh in God. there now that had been sitting there for a month as well. Never heard of anything like that in my life. <laughs> no wonder I was in so much pain. <laughs> yeah. Um, but obviously with the bloat, I felt fat. So I th I'd stopped eating because I thought, well, I'm fat. I've put on weight. So I think I'd lost over a stone just in that two months um, since the pain had started. So they did surgery, drained it. I was in hospital for about three days. And um, I think they did the surgery. It was that day or the, it might, it might have been the next day or it was in the middle of the night. So I'd been, and then I was in for about three or four days recovering. Um, it's the first surgery they did, they just drained it and I was like bleeding. I was on a catheter and everything. It was just horrible. And having having to lay there with your legs open and all kind of doctors, male doctors coming in, they had a needle, I swear to God, about this long, went up there um, whilst I was awake, I think. And like... There, there was about eight doctors, um, mostly male. It was just, I'm sort of like naked bottom half and really hurt and prodding and poking and needles and asking questions and um, asking me if I'm sexually active, if I could have any sexually transmitted diseases, if I um, could be pregnant. Um, so sort of they asked, not in front of my mum, so they still respect like confidentiality even sort of as a teenager which I think is so important but um I was like no like I don't I'm, I'm not pregnant and I looked pregnant by this point because it was so swollen um and my mum was like are you sure you're not pregnant like it doesn't make kind of a joke but kind of like I was like no I'm, like, I'm definitely not and that was obviously making me think shit they're they all going to find out about what happened when I was a kid but it wasn't at the time I wasn't thinking of it as in what happened I was thinking of it as what I've done what I've let happen um, so they joined, had this surgery and then went home after about a week, I think. And um, 
I either tried a day at school, but I was too ill to walk around. So I think they had me in a wheelchair, <laughs> pushed me around to school. And I was so pale and I'd lost weight by this point. Like even like kids who didn't like me were coming up to me and telling how good I look. Cause it's like thin was in at that age. And it was like the heroin chic. Um, we'd just come out of the heroin chic sort of modeling um, time. So um, um, I was like, happy with the weight loss, but <laughs> I, it's because I wasn't well. And I think I did maybe a day or even half a day at school and the pain came back. And I remember being at home, sitting on the sofa and the swelling had come back, but I was told that I'd have a regular period after this. And everyone says that periods are really painful. So I thought, well, maybe this pain's normal and the bloating, maybe that's normal too. So I think I stayed home about two weeks with this pain. And there was one day I was sat on the sofa and the dog was on my lap, a little pug, and she jumped off my she jumped off my lap to bark at the telly <laughs> and she'd kicked my um stomach where it was um where it was where I'd had the surgery it just hurt so much um so um I think I ended up going back to hospital either that day or in the middle of the night I remember no it was middle of the night I can't remember which day it was but I tried to hold it off I tried to hold off going to hospital as long as possible because I just didn't want to go back there because they kept touching me everywhere and um I was trying to fight it on my own, I guess. <laughs> um, so we've gone back to hospital. I think it's now two weeks since I had had the surgery or since I'd been discharged from hospital the first time. The swelling was back, but 10 times worse. Um, the pain was back 10 times worse than before this first surgery. And I looked really like deathly pale and bags under my eyes, even though all I was doing was sleeping. And I was struggling to like but to drink or anything because absolutely anything I ate or drank would just bloat hurt my belly. Um, so they did an ultrasound, they're like abs distended. Um, as soon as they did an ultrasound, they're like, we need to do surgery again. Something that we don't know what's going on, but basically my body had healed up um, where they'd cut the hymen open. My body had healed it up. So the blood's gone back in, infected, oh, same damn. problem, third month now. Um, Except this time where they'd done surgery, it then got infected. So I had sepsis. Oh. So it was infected blood now. And my womb was big circle balloon ready to burst. And if it had burst, I would have probably died because it was infected Jesus blood. Christ. Would have gone into my bloodstream. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. Um, Can't believe what you've been through. <laughs> we're just starting. This is like... <laughs> um, so I had another surgery and they, instead of just cutting one way, they cut crisscross cut this time, drained it. Um, found out as an adult that apparently the hospital I went to is like famous for giving people sepsis during surgeries. And like, I've had sepsis three times from there. <laughs> three times. Separate times, like, um, and I've got a friend who's really chronically sick and has had sepsis three times from that hospital as well <laughs> but yeah after the second surgery it's they drained it I was in hospital for a really long it felt like a really long time I think about at least three weeks maybe a month um and that's just in hospital and I was recovering for a month or so after that and still not really eating so I went down from about say 11 stone 11 and a half went down to like eight and a half just under nine, nine stone and I remember sort of when you've got an eating disorder when when I've when when someone's got an eating disorder, you spend so much time sort of just looking at your body in the mirror to see, am I losing? Am I gaining? I'm disgusting. Um, if it's a changing and bones are showing, it feels good. And it's like, because that's what you've associated with being happy and being loved and being enough. Um, and I remember coming out of hospital after the second time and sucking in after they drained it. So all of what I thought was fat for months was just swelling. So when they'd actually drained that, they drained... I think they said it was two pints of a quarter of the whole blood in my body they drained from that um but the sepsis stayed after they drained so um third time I went to hospital now a couple months after that it's like I remember sucking in in the mirror and where I'd usually suck in and just see ribs it was like a dip under my ribs where the ribs meet to the middle of your chest it almost went up like a cavity almost um where I was just that <laughs> kind of, I'd lost that much weight and um I remember being in hospital and just wanting to eat but I tried to eat and I was on IV antibiotics 24 hours a day 
Um, so, and they'd had to start going in my hand veins because they'd gone so much into my arms and it quite hurts there. I don't know why the skin's a bit thicker. Um, but so maybe it hurts more because of that, but I just remember every two hours they'd come and wake you up to do blood pressure or take vitals or, um, I had to just drink disgusting meds. I had eight different injections every day and then an ongoing one on a drip. And I remember trying to, I remember standing up and trying to walk after being in bed and not eating at all for about two weeks. And it was about four days after the surgery and I'd had a catheter and I had not been at the bed wash and everything and not been out of that bed for two weeks. And I remember trying to stand up um, and I just, I think I'd been laying down. So they moved the bed to sort of sit at the position I'm at the angle I'm sitting now. And I just went from here to sitting up um, just got to stand up and then blacked out and fainted. Um, I think because obviously my blood, they, my blood sugars w would have been low. Like, I don't really understand when you're in, in hospital, why they only give you, um, electrolytes. So the, like they only replace your water. They don't replace food. So if you're not eating for months when you're ill, they don't give you a tube feed or anything. You just don't eat. <laughs> um, so yeah, that, it was quite frustrating to be fainting and just too ill to do anything to even go to the toilet or anything but it's like you don't need the toilet much when you're not eating <laughs> um but i remember charlie came to visit once with my sister um because we were still kind of allowed to hang out once in a while um must have been 12 then and <laughs> um, not 13 <laughs> but um i think him and my sister got a bit hyper and obviously they had kids they're full of energy and I wasn't because I was ill and I remember laying down in this bed and they'd started throwing like crisps or chicken nuggets at me like which <laughs> obviously it's funny for like two minutes and then it's like I, I couldn't even shout or like fight back um because I only like play fighting but I was too ill to even hold my arm up to like barely call the nurse's button but so I couldn't even I didn't want to get them in trouble either. It was like, come on guys. Like, so I just started crying. Like I couldn't, I, I couldn't even shout. I couldn't even talk. I was like whispering because I was just so weak. And I remember the nurse came and she kicked them out. Like, no, you've upset Nita. You need to go now. <laughs> um, but my sister got time off school, I think, to come and see me. She'd sneak off school and come and see me all day in the hospital. And I remember like, even on the first day, I think this is just a lack of like self love or self worth, but even on the first day I was in there and it's scary being away from home when you're that young. Um, I remember wanting, most people wanted their mum with them all day. And I remember saying to mum like, no, like it's okay. I know you've got other stuff to do. And I remember thinking, especially like the first night where I was sort of with it enough to, to feel scared of sort of being on my own and that, um, especially when there was hardly anyone else on the ward if there was like loads of empty beds and it's just a dark, scary hospital. <laughs> I remember thinking like, no, my mum's got four other kids to look after and it's not all about me and it's, I don't want to take up everyone's time. And obviously my dad would have been working all day, but they all came up to see me. At least someone, someone would come up at least every day. Um, and when I, when I got my strength back a bit well enough to walk, I'd, I'd like, I think I got my friends to sneak, sneak me some cigarettes in and I'd walk, I remember walking with my drip, um, and like climbing on the kitchen counter. Cause there was like a little kitchen area in the teens ward. <laughs> and I remember climbing up on the counter and smoking out the window, <laughs> like attached to all tubes and stuff. And just like, um, I think a nurse had come out of the bottom pit. I was like, oh shit, like throwing my cigarette. And <laughs> um, but when I come out of hospital, I think. I tried to keep the weight off by starving, but as I got better and my appetite came back, I just struggled to not binge. So the purging really started then. And it wasn't a family member's fault that I started purging, like it would have started anyway, but I didn't know how you can actually do that. It was only when this family member said, oh, you'd never do that, would you? And I'm like, what, to lose weight? I'm like, what, um, do this to make yourself throw up so you don't hold the calories. I'm not gonna say it cause I don't wanna, um tell anyone how to do it that doesn't know how <laughs> but I'm like oh no I'd never be that stupid but I didn't know how to do it and I only tried it after that <laughs> um but I'd, I'd binge probably more than I'd starve so I'd always end up putting on weight um but I'd started getting in trouble with the police by this point as well um just like petty stuff um like spray painting and um, drinking and just being a nuisance <laughs> but um, 
I remember the first time getting sort of properly manhandled by the police. I think I was 12 or 13, but I think I was 11 the first time I was like brought home and that was spray paint. I'd like spray painted a, the first letter of my name in the parking pink spray paint. And the police had asked me three times, was it me? And I said, yeah. On the last one, I was like, yeah, it was me because it was pretty obvious. And they said like, if I hadn't admitted it, then they would have had to take me to court and arrest me properly. So like, I just got off on a, like, a written caution or something, if that. Um, because I'd been honest and eventually, <laughs> but um, yeah, the first time getting properly restrained by police, like I they had like a bit of a, grabbed me a bit when I was 11 with the spray paint, but not, pro it wasn't like, not, not like having eight male police officers sitting on you basically. <laughs> um, and all you can see is heavy boots and you can't move at all. Like even pinning my head and my neck in place to the floor because I, if I was restrained to the point where I was like and basically hogtied with someone, some like 20 stone adult bloke coffer sitting on my back and one holding my legs, one holding my arms, I would just bang my head on the floor trying to knock myself out. So I was just proper angry. And I think self harm had started at this age, about 11, 12, that had started the self harm. Um, it's what actually, sorry. <laughs> what had you been arrested for? Um, First time properly arrested. No, this um, the spray paint. Hand the manhandling. Um. Oh, first time was witness intimidation. <laughs> it's not as bad as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd had a fight with a friend because they dubbed on me for drinking for my twelfth birthday. No, for twelve or thirteenth. Oh God, was it twelve? <laughs> it was my twelfth birthday because there's certain people there that I only met at certain ages <laughs> um, we were drinking day drinking for our 12th birthday and my friend cook told her mum because it's bad for you and which is really cute now <laughs> looking back that's what a good kid but I just didn't think that at the time I'm actually really good friends with this girl now she's one of my best friends <laughs> <laughs> but um her mum had then called the police and I'd thought it was one of the other friends in our group so I'd been arguing with them half the day drunk by this point and then to find out who who sort of grasped on us and I was upset because I'd been in trouble with my mum and we ended up just having a verbal argument but I think I might have I pushed her and she fell over like I didn't hit her or anything but I pushed her but um yeah felt super bad about it but um she'd called the police and told them that I'd like beat her up basically and like she hadn't hit her face when when I pushed her and she just fell so like we thought she'd sort of maybe whacked herself in the face. I don't know. And it's hard to remember exact details of it, but um, yeah, she called the police and they'd arrest, they um, were looking into, they'd cautioned me for assault. So they'd questioned me, but hadn't arrested me. It was more one of those, you need to come into the station for a voluntary chat, but if, it's voluntary, but if you don't, then you get arrested. Um, and then, so I'd given a statement. A couple of weeks later, we bumped into her at the park with other friends, and she said, "Oh, I, I just want this all to be over." And I, I thought I'd pretend to be her friend so that she'd drop the charges. And she's, I'm like, "Look, I'm really sorry. We're all mates. We've all got the same friends. It'd be silly falling out. I am really sorry. I didn't mean to push you, and I'm sorry. Can you withdraw the thing, please?" <laughs> um, and like, it's. She said, oh, look, I don't want anything more to do with it. And I'm so, well, why don't you withdraw your statement? Like, it's okay. And she's like, oh, I don't have a phone. I'm like, here you go. You can use mine. And I have my sister's phone. <laughs> and the police had my sister's phone stored, my twin, on their database. So they thought, hang on, the victim's calling on the defendant's sister's phone to withdraw her statement. <laughs> um, so they came into school and arrested both of us because they thought, like, my sister was always the good one. So that's why. <laughs> but it was still her phone. So... They arrested both of us. I felt so bad. My sister looked so scared. And it was in school. So it's like, I, I couldn't act scared because I had this like rude girl persona <laughs> at school. Like, um, But I remember they came in. I felt weird because um, I'd been called to go to the deputy head's office at the beginning of um, school. But usually you'd have like a, a sheet with it or they'd tell you a reason, but they wouldn't tell me a reason. They were like, you've just been told to go to this office. So I went to this office, but it wasn't the teacher's usual office. It was like, just almost like an interview room, I suppose, where they interview or, um, yeah, where the people who were coming to visit from outside the school go and 
have adult chats. <laughs> um, so we got to this room and the teacher that was supposed to be in there, she either wasn't in there or she was in there with this big bloke and then just left me and this bloke in the room. And I didn't know him. He was a big, like six foot nine, quite <laughs> like wide as well. <laughs> um, and obviously I'm really tall. I'm always been tall. I'm not, I used to get really intimidated by people that are taller than me, especially blokes like even now, <laughs> because all the police kind of altercations when I whenever I meet blokes that are taller than me um no I don't get it with women but if I meet men that are taller than me I like size them up like hey I could take you on if you could go <laughs> I still do it now like I can't <laughs> um but I'm yeah that she got, started the, then. She got arrived today she's like I'm taller than you <laughs> <laughs> that's the first thing she said <laughs> yeah so you're not intimidated by short <laughs> me neither <laughs> but yes um, <laughs> who was this very tall um, man so he's a police officer but not in uniform um <laughs> like freaking like FBI agents when they come and arrest people on like action movies like not you like in a suit black suit black shirt um like sunglasses a lot <laughs> I was like mate who are you trying to kid like <laughs> <laughs> um but I sensed something was wrong so I was like I'm just gonna go to the toilet um um well, like as in I'm gonna take all my bag and all my stuff with me <laughs> um and he's like no um not at the moment I was like fine look I'll leave my stuff here thinking I'll just come back for it like I, I am coming back kind of thing and then just as I tried to get to the door he's like got in the way so I couldn't and I've tried to make a run for it and like run under his arm so he had his arm out like that and I've tried to like run under him um but he grabbed my arm twisted it behind my back pushed me on the desk kind of like that how they push people up against the car when the police arrest people um so I started like all my um big tough talk like oh get the fuck off me I'll oh, think you're hard like who the fuck are you like <laughs> and my friend who was at the um event where where I'd pushed the girl and we were drinking, another friend who was there was in a separate room. And you know, it's like, oh, they've got us all, you know, <laughs> all your friends who have been naughty with are all in separate rooms and you're thinking, oh shit, like it's, it's getting, <laughs> something's gonna happen. <laughs> yeah, that was happening and that had happened. And my twin was in another room. And um, so this bag, the guy, he's handcuffed me and then obviously told me that he's police by that point walked me out to a car and then separately I see my twin being walked with this police officer who was like the community officer who'd always come into the schools and give the talks and I'd never seen him actually do, like do arresting people do police work it was always just him coming in to chat and for kids to ask questions and that um but he'd arrested my sister um she wasn't handcuffed but she was crying and she looked really like scared and nervous so I was about to cry but I was like shook it off to look um to look brave and strong for her so that she didn't get upset and I remember shouting across the car park <laughs> that's all right don't worry um like don't worry they've got nothing on us like I ain't done nothing <laughs> um and it was the same it was like the first time getting properly booked into custody and um yeah, I think they booked us in. We were still obviously away from each other. Like, nope, you're not allowed to talk to her. But she was crying. I was like, don't fucking make my sister cry. <laughs> um, and then I told them, yeah, I was like, look, my sister hasn't done anything. I've done it all. And I was like, don't worry, babe, we'll be home soon. <laughs> like, mum will pick us up and we'll go and have dinner and watch Simpsons. Like, just trying <laughs> to talk about normal day stuff yeah. to take her mind out of it. So um, I think they didn't make her wait in the cell for too long. But I was kicking off, so they made me wait in one. Because I think it was like kicking off to show her, look, see, like they can't even make me stand in one spot. So how are they going to hurt you? <laughs> um, it's when they have those red buzzers, though, in the police station, they're like on the wall. And as soon as you kick off, they're like, meh, meh, meh. They're like, oh, like every, never seen so many people run so fast. They're coming <laughs> out of every like wall. It's like <laughs> <laughs> doors you'd have thought were a cupboard or were actually a room, and there's just loads of them coming from everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> um, I nearly escaped from custody once. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> um, I was about fifteen. It might have been the time they kept me in there for five days. I think because I was so bored, I just like pressed the buzzer. Oh, I need the toilet, and then kick off just for something to do. <laughs> um, 
Um, so I think I'd I'd been to hospital. I was like, oh, my arm's broken. Like it wasn't. I just was bored and wanted to go out for the day. <laughs> so they took me to hospital and they're all pissed off coming back. And I think there was like, um, I was at the custody back at the booking desk and there was just one long corridor that went up to the stairs to like the main police station and that door opens up to like the normal world where I thought if I could just get up there then I get out so, but I've seen someone open it and it, it closes really slowly and someone had opened it from our side so like I had no one to run past I thought, I thought fuck it fancy by chance I just legged it they pressed that red buzzer on the wall <laughs> <They'd all come laughs> out I literally just got to the door I almost got to the door like I could like taste the freedom <laughs> um <laughs> that's so stupid looking back now but <laughs> so from so from like this age then to 15 um what's the what was the abuser's name again the main guy um from when he was nine is that, um, Drew, is, Drew, Drew. is that all stopped from that age now with him? But it's you're just all, getting in trouble all, with the law. And yeah. other, pe other pe predators are coming into your life. Yeah, so that Drew and James, that's properly stopped the sexual abuse now. But it's like, say we had mutual friends and everyone's out drinking at parties and stuff because you start going to parties at that sort of age. It's like I, try, I just want them to acknowledge that it happened. And... I think he he felt uncomfortable around me, I noticed, and would never, um, like he'd, if I went somewhere and he was there, he'd then go, so it made it easier for me to be there. Um, that was James would go, but Drew would usually stay. So like we used to go to youth club quite a lot. It was just something fun to do with all our friends. And um, you'd get kind of like therapy in there almost because you could talk about stuff with the staff but also hang out and do activities like um then like craft stuff painting and exercise stuff and then all those like team building um outdoor activities they do um as part of the youth club so but drew used to go there he started going there even when he was like 18 he'd just start popping in randomly so, um well he would have been about 20 by this point actually so my sister had to stop going and it sucked because that was like her main outlet i guess um do you think he was worried about getting caught because you were getting older and he realized you knew now that this was serious i think so um i think even if it would come up mildly in a group of people he'd deny it like well no what are you on about why would i ever come near you kind of thing um so to jump forward a little bit but um I think at 15, I'd been drinking a lot. I'd been kicked out of my first high school and I'd gone to another one and I was just drinking all the time and started taking up with drugs. And I think, I can't remember if I was on hard drugs properly or not at, at this time, but um, I, was, I was drunk and my older sister... She'd sort. I think I'd been getting arrested a lot, so my fam, like my mum, my parents, and my older sister, felt like they were always pissed off with me, um, because we were always getting in trouble and they didn't know why, and we had all this potential, like getting A stars, top of the the whole school, not just the class or the year group, but like whatever lesson I tried and and um, judo, and we like could have done anything, um, we just seemed like we were throwing it all away and just not trying in school, getting kicked out of school and getting arrested and just drinking all day. Um, so I was drunk, I was on the sofa. I think, I don't think I was upset. I think I was just talking with my older sister and we had like, I think when you've got an older sibling that's more than sort of eight, nine years older than you, you have like, you're still siblings and you can still argue and bicker like kids, but they've also got a kind of auntie or uncle responsibility where it's like halfway in between a parent and an, and a sibling. Um, because they've got that sort of life experience. They're a lot older than you. And um, so the relationship dynamics kind of go between um, just being bickering, arguing kids to sort of having that person I can confide in. Um, so I think we were talking about, she was just asking, oh, what's the furthest you've gone with a boy? Um, because we were talking about boys. And I think... She, uh, I think she started like taking the mic like oh did he touch your winky and I'm like no he fucking raped me and then just burst out crying um so 
I think she, I'd say she didn't believe me straight away, but just it was just out of moments. It wasn't like, it didn't go on for ages. She, and she didn't question me sort of, she didn't question me at the time or say anything horrible. She's like, um, is this true? Like, when um, and who? Um, and um, I think she'd gone from like us almost semi-arguing and me being really shitty because I think before asking me what, what have you done with the boy, she'd been like, why are you doing this to mum and dad? Why are, you, why are you doing this? Why are you getting arrested drinking? Like, why are you doing this to our family? Um, and then she'd like sat down next to me and put her arm around me and just had a hug. <sighs> Sorry. <laughs> Oh, uh, crying face. <laughs> um, yeah, we just talked about it, and I didn't go into details, but I said, and I kept it as like a. When you say "Have you been abused?" it's like saying I was raped, as opposed to I was abused. Abused makes it sound like it was gone on for longer, whereas rape people think just once, so it's kind of less hard to talk about. But I told her when it happened, and she said, "When? Like, how old were you?" And I was like, "I don't know." Oh, oh she said, "By who?" And I said by James and Drew, but their real names. Um, that's not their real names, obviously. <laughs> um, and she's like, when? Cause like you stopped seeing them ages ago. And I'm like, yeah, I know. Like, um, obviously in her mind, I think when you say, yeah, I've been raped, you're thinking at worst, it's gotta be in the last year or something. Cause that's sort of when all this, my behavior sort of reached a boiling point. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, but then I told her it was from sort of, yeah, nine, ten, and she's like, "This this explains so much." And she's, I think she's like, either she asked you, either she asked or was like, "Right, do you want me to tell mum and dad, or do you want to?" But we need to tell someone. Um, but she still left it in my choice, and I think I said, "Can we wait a cut just another a couple of days?" And I told her that it happened to my sister as well. And yeah, she gave me that a day or two, and. I asked if she could tell them. Um, so she did. And I think I think we waited till they were in person. I think she told them first and then so they'd know what the conversation was going to be about. And then, yeah, I had a chat with mum and dad and I think they just gave me a hug and said, like, it's going to be okay. And, like, this explains everything. And I'm like, well, how? Like, how how does this i'm still a horrible person and i'm ruining this family from my behavior that i don't i'm just doing because i hate myself but it's making everyone else suffer as well um and you don't know why you're feeling shit you just know that you feel shit all the time and sort of drinking and drugs are the only way to escape that and if i could do that in a way without hurting my family i would have but um yeah, I told mum and dad and then started um, going forward with legal, um, the legal route of fixing that. But that sort of starts the next set of issues because I wasn't ready to go to the police and I didn't want to. And I felt like because I told my parents, I took that out of my sister's hands. I didn't, I think because it came out while I was drunk, I didn't think about it. And I wouldn't have said, I'm glad it, yeah, I'm glad it came out at all because it might not have ever come out. But my sister was never in that loop. It was never her choice to say, and just as much shit happened to her. Um, and we all had a cry and a chat and, um, yeah, went through the place. I think it brought us closer, but it was like, even though it was like, in a way it explained all of my behavior, why I started being a shit bag from like 11 years old and why I'd suddenly gone from like getting a stars or whatever the number equivalent was with grades and like winning sports day for like everyone would they just put me on every single race because they knew i'd win all of them um and like training to uh, to train for the to um compete for the olympic team and that at judo like to go from that to just carving my arms up and binging and purging and drinking and being kicked out of all schools and not doing any sports and quitting music as well. I think my parents thought that, okay, now we know why we've got to the bottom of it. Like now you can start being normal. They never said it like that. Or now you can start being happy again. But I feel like 
I thought that would happen as well. I thought that, okay, they all know there we've reached a end, a conclusion. And now I can start, you know, going back to school and trying and not drinking and not being in so much pain. But the pain just got kind of worse because it was like, now it's all out in the open and now we have to go to court and I don't want to. And you have to relive all of that trauma. And like, even in the interview room, when the police were asking what I was wearing, I thought, oh, it's <laughs> my stupid 15 year old brain is like, oh, they're just trying to set the scene. And like my twin, my twin said, as we got older, she said, no, they weren't trying to set the scene. It's like, they were trying to ask, was it your fault or not? They're asking, oh, well, well, oh, she was wearing a mini skirt kind of thing. They didn't say that, but it's like, that's probably why they're asking what we were wearing. Cause it's, it's not like there could be camera footage or anything for them to be trying to confirm who we are. Um, and I was like, no, I was, um, and where was it? Were you drinking? Were you at a party? It's like, no, it happened in the daytime at a park as a kid wearing a tracksuit or equivalent, like, so. I imagine the fact that your sister was there selling the same thing the, the uh, stories coincided. Yeah, so they couldn't. Yeah, that, yeah. Would, that would verify it. Mm. I think it put my parents through so much pain that um, I hate saying this because it's it's no one's fault except the abusers that abused me originally. But um, the pain that that caused my whole family, like my parents, nearly split up. I think multiple families felt suicidal and could have done it and just all that pain and it's affected my entire life and lots of family members lives um to the point where like I might be dying now from a physical illness caused or triggered by stress from all the shit that I've been through um I thought all that pain was going to happen anytime I tell about abuse. So the second time I, well, the first time, the second rape, proper rape, I guess, was at 17 or I was almost 18. It would have been. Before you go to that, did they bring Drew and James in for questioning at this point? Yeah. And what happened mm -hmm. with them? So they both got, so at the time, James had been under a different name. He'd changed his name since the abuse happened, just the first name. So we didn't have any picture of him. I knew what he looks like, but they were saying we can't find this person by this name. They're, this person doesn't exist. However, we found this person that was hanging around with Drew at the time was fits, looks a bit different, but like this person is fits the description of what you're describing and was hanging around with Drew at the time, was the same age. Um, all of the different details match this person but I thought no it can't be him because that's the old the brother of a friend we've had since we were older and this is the brother who'd hated me for no reason it's when we were kids and we'd gone around this friend's house had been in their house not knowing who he was um and then so we told the police I thought well no it's not him we got the wrong person and then we were getting shit from everyone we're like oh what um his younger brother who was in our friend group was like why are you trying to say that my brother raped you what the fuck and I was like oh no they got the wrong person sorry and I was apologizing and then it obviously went around the school um teachers parents all the kids so then all those kids hated me all over again and then a couple years so I, I withdrew the J James's part and I said like I don't think it was him we think you got the wrong person but a couple of years later, I went on, this back when we had communal laptops, there was like one laptop for the family. And I went on an old picture album. I can't remember who I, what I was looking for, but it was on an album that my sister had downloaded. I think it was a Facebook album. And I saw this picture and it was a picture of James as a kid, as we knew him, maybe a year or two older at the max. And I thought, oh fuck, that's him. And, um, I asked my sister about it and she'd gone on Facebook and been scrolling through because I thought you know, the police had found him, that the police are convinced it's him, but it can't be, but scrolled through his picture looking for the oldest, oldest picture because the way they could have figured out if it was him or not was him giving a pitch, giving us a photo of when he was that age, but he wouldn't, he refused and his whole family refused and wouldn't even let the police come in. So it's like they all bloody knew. Um, but as soon as I scrolled through to the oldest picture, I found this picture. It's a picture of him sort of standing at a lake fishing um, with his shirt off and um, his short hair. And it was just, that's him. That's how I remembered him. 
And I was like, fuck, I thought, fuck, like the police had him. They could have, something could have been done. And like, we stopped that. And now that person lives about 10 houses behind me. And Drew's family, direct family live right opposite me. So Drew's family live opposite me, but James and his missus live about 10 houses behind me on the other side. So I can see them both from every single window in my house. Right now. Oh my right God. now. That's, um, that's... I have to so, walk past so them. Let me get this day. straight then. So the cops went to the wrong brother. No. Um, the older brother. Oh, no. So the older brother, that was that was the abuser. That was James. But I didn't know that at the time. Because the photograph. Um, how, how so the changed? friend we've so been you hanging withdrew out it because you thought they had the wrong brother, yeah, but they, had they, the, had the they, wrong had, they did have James. Yeah, so we thought so we were friends with his younger brother, and we thought the older brother. We thought that was a completely different person to James because he looked so different. He changed his hair and his name, and lost loads of weight. So he maybe because he knew he'd done wrong, and why else would you drastically change your appearance and your name at that age? No. Um, and there was a party so my older sister who's she's her one of her best friends it's getting a bit complicated sorry one of her best friends is brothers with a friend um with one of drew's friends so it's a family she's a family friend she's not so my sister's friend let's call her anne Anne's brother is friends with Drew. And after all the abuse and stuff came out, Anne's brother, nothing to do with it, but Anne was at, Anne's brother's hosting a barbecue and Drew was there. And they're about 18 or 20 at this point. And um, Anne went straight up to him, up to Drew and said, is it true then what you did to the girls? And in front of everyone, he goes, oh, that was ages ago. So he admitted it in front of everyone. Um, She's like, is it true? It's disgusting what you did to them girls. Um, yeah, didn't even deny it. And he said, oh, that was ages ago. Um, so nothing happened to either of them no. when no, it was initially nothing. reported? No, they got arrested, but there wasn't enough evidence. Obviously, they both denied it. It was just your word against their word. So we only any... dropped the charges against James, not Drew, because we convinced he had the wrong person. But a few years later, I went back and told them after I'd written my book and said, yeah, I think it was him. But I just didn't want to put my family through that again. I was at quite a good place in life. I was working and driving and had a fiancé. I didn't, didn't want to mess it all up by putting my head in that space again. So did anything happen to Drew if the charges were not dropped Nothing. against him? Not enough so it was evidence. like a no further action but thing. But the police, like, they all knew. It was, they said, and they said they knew something had gone on with us and they had suspected it. With him specifically, they'd suspected it for years. And because we went forward, about the, about four of those six girls that we knew went forward to the police. And then after that, it was like, they found out there was, I think, about 20 girls altogether. Oh wow. From eight years old, seven, from seven to 13, had been abused by these two. Over. This all came out after you reported it. Yeah. And those women came forward. Yeah, but because none of it was brought to court, none of it had enough evidence to bring to court. Um, I'm nothing sorry, happened if 20 and both women around. come forward. What do they need more than that? Yeah. That's crazy, isn't it? Crazy. Um, yeah. So when nothing happened to them then, what? how did that make you feel psychologically? It was hard, I think. At first it was really hard because obviously I'd go out clubbing and we live in the same town as them. I didn't live on the same road as them at that point. Um, I don't think I would have managed to. Um, but um, it made it hard to go out anywhere because I'd be out having a good day and then I could bump into them at the shop. I worked at a swimming pool for a bit. They'd come swimming with their kids and they had kids by this point and partners and life. And I used to think like, fuck you, like how how are you moving on and living a normal life and I'm suffering with mental health and um, my family is suffering, you know? Um, but it was just hard. I could be working and be fine and they turn up at work or I'd go out with anywhere I went, they could be. Because I know where you be. live. I'm obviously not going to repeat that on this, yeah. but it's very, very small town. Yeah. Yeah, so. Even like my road, I live on a cul-de-sac and they're both in that cul-de-sac. Or one of them's in, oh, sorry, the family of one of them's in the cul-de-sac oh. and then the other one's on the, literally a road behind me. Have you thought about getting out of that area because of I your have, mental health? I have, but 
a part of me thinks like I've got a beautiful house why should I give it up for them and I'd never get a place as good as I've got now um sort of on housing association I'd never get a good a deal I don't know anyone that's got a house as nice as mine on um council so I'm really lucky to have it and I think fuck them they'll probably have more kids and move in a year or two and I'm hopefully going to be running my own business very soon anyway so fuck them I'm gonna make enough money to buy my own house and yeah it's not going to be forever but it was really hard it's hard when my mental health suffering to live that close to them um there's like I suffer with psychosis on and off um when I've had psychotic episodes I've been worried that they were in the house I could hear their voices um and I know straight almost after as soon as my episodes finish I know it's not real but at the time it feels so real all right, so you're going to go back to when you were 14. Um, so 14, quite a lot has happened already, obviously with the sexual abuse and stuff. Um, I was just acting out so much at school and my grades had slipped from acting out outside of school, getting arrested and that, but still being able to maintain like straight A's without trying. That had kind of stopped and I got moved into like really low, the lower sets. Um, so I'd get really bored in the lessons and be acting out more at school so um, I eventually got kicked out of my first high school for lots of stuff over loads of years like you most of it was really petty stuff just like not but I think my mental health was really suffering at that age and I mean, there was one lesson I was just too depressed to even get my books out of my bag I was just sat there and was like well, what's the point like we're all gonna die anyway <laughs> um and I got kicked out of the lesson and like in trouble and whereas now Surely that would say that a kid's not well, but um, there's really no mental health help at the moment. And despite how bad it was when I was a kid and they did it, it's like even worse now and it just sucks. But I think in general, people are more aware of it um, and open to talk about it. And like, it's it's not this um, big scary thing that means you're crazy if you just feel a bit low sometimes. Um, so my mental health was suffering and I'd started self-harming at this point. Um, quite a few people at my school had. Um, I didn't know about it until I'd seen other people do it. Um, but I think I did it with a friend, like mucking about. It's, it's such a weird thing to do. <laughs> yeah. In a lesson at school, I think, was the very first time. But I'd cut a bit too deep by accident. And um it needed to be, you know, how deep it needs to be glued or stitches, but I didn't go to hospital, I just taped it. But the kind of adrenaline and happiness, not happiness, but adrenaline rush I felt was better than just feeling flat, which I'd feel all the time from depression. So then I did it when I was upset and stressed, and then that became quite often. Um, did you say it became trendy in your school to self-harm? Mm. Yeah, so... Why did, I, the oh. why did the first... How did it start? <laughs> Um, I was going to skip this bit, but <laughs> um, so the first time, oh, it's such a weird story and I don't think there's anyone else in the world who would have started self-harming in this way, but basically one year, our whole year group turned emo and <laughs> started self-harming to be like, oh, you can be in our little club, but you have to do a little cut and everyone would just do one and then they'd go on with their lives and not have mental health, most of the kids that did that. And um how did justin bieber come into this <laughs> yeah so oh, justin bieber would have been about 16 at this time really young like just started getting famous and i think he'd split up he'd, something had happened like he'd been arrested or something and a girl it was said rumored that a girl had cut herself out of stress because justin bieber was because of something justin bieber did so then everyone started doing it um Everyone started doing it just, I don't know, just because we thought it was funny and the teachers would get all just weirded out and pissed off that l suddenly half of the class has got self-harm cuts. Um, but then one kid did it on his face Ooh. and they said if it had gone any deeper, he would have had a scar for life. Um, but so I, not to just join in and be doing what everyone else is doing, but I mean, I was feeling shit anyway and I'd... I'd never seen anyone do that until every every kid was doing it. So it seemed like the norm. And I was always so naughty and that like, always felt like I had to be the most at anything. So either the best of the best or the worst of the worst. So if I was gonna cut, it was always gonna be, it had to be deeper than everyone else's. 
And I, I was in a classroom in a lesson with the same friend who I bumped into, we'll call him Stee, with the same friend who I bumped into recently who was in the lesson that that male teacher put his hand down my shirt. Stee was there too. And yeah, this was a lesson with Stee. I think we were actually, might have been year seven or eight. This, sorry, this is back going back to about 12. But um, yeah, he sort of showed me how he did his and it was, I'm not gonna explain that because I don't wanna give anyone ideas. Um, but he showed me how and what, so I copied, but I um, obviously ended up going a bit deeper than them by accident and it scared me because I could see the fat Mm. Um, so past the skin it's like blue where you've got the veins running through and then there's like these little white yellow balls of fat and it just oh. is gross but um, I had such an adrenaline rush like mostly out of fear but it it was the first time I'd felt anything since the sexual abuse had started so then I tried doing it when I was upset or doing it at home on my own and um like suddenly it made all of that upset go away because all I could feel was the adrenaline and then just happy, calm, relaxed. So I started doing that when I was really upset, but then that became just one shit day and just, it became like really minimal reasons really. And because it's quite addictive self-harm, when I first started, there was one time I was about 12 and around the house obviously I'd wear and at school I'd wear long sleeves to cover up my scars well my open cuts but um and my parents had been made aware from the school that I'd done it and so I'd wear sle long sleeves around my parents but this one time I was playing my piano I had an electric piano I play by ear and taught myself since I was eight I was about 12 and I'd cut my arms up both of them up to about here just cut pff, must have been 50 cuts and all deep enough to need gluing so I'd have to tape them back up and they weren't dressed I'd just tape them so they had a bit of tape over the ones that needed stitches but then no bandages and I because I was in my bedroom I was just playing my piano with my with just a t-shirt like I've got on now and my dad walked in um has had a, such a go at me like what the fuck why are you like you're making yourself look like a fucking like you're fucking your body up um having a go like what the fuck what the fuck have you done to yourself? Um, and I quickly grabbed a hoodie and put it on. But I remember turning around, like playing piano, happy, da da da. Heard my door go, um, heard the door open. I was like, oh, all right, dad, all happy with all these cuts up my arms. Like as if I think when parents, especially like 10, 20 years ago or 10 years ago or so, when parents think, okay, a kid with depression, they've got to look like depressed all the time. But I think, I could be that upset that I'd cover my arm up that many times, but then feel happy later on or feel okay for a few hours or a few minutes. So I think it's quite an odd, I guess it was maybe a weirder thing for him to see like all those cuts, all that damage, but then I'm happy. So what, what the fuck, why am I doing that? Um, My parents have heard me purging as well. I was going to say, horrible. were you purging at the same time as self-harming? Yeah, so the purging, I only really did it, I only managed to actually bring anything up a few <clears throat> times throughout my teen years. It was mainly after the second round of abuse that starts at 17 that it got really bad. But um, there was one Christmas, sorry to jump to and from, but there was one Christmas where I ended up purging. I'd had a bit of a, I say an argument, not a massive argument, and it's not Christmas without a family argument, but um, my older sister had said something that made me feel like, it was something really small, like I'd made a comment, um, like it wasn't even an argument, but it was just, she just said one thing, and to everyone else it was like, okay, they've said that, we hadn't even fell out, and you just move on with the day and the conversation, but when you've got mental health, someone could say, oh, you're not supposed to do that like that, and you'd think, oh shit, I should just go and, and now you just want to go home and lock yourself in a room and not talk to anyone or be anywhere. And that happened. So uh, we'd just eaten Christmas dinner. So I just went and purred to get rid of the stress. And I opened the door and my dad was behind me. He was out in in the hallway outside the bathroom. Um, but that time, that, that was after I'd been purging for quite a while. Um, 
and I'd lost the movement in my foot because of um, electrolyte imbalance from purging so much. Your body start when you're that malnourished from purging, your body starts shutting off nerves from um, bits of your body that are the furthest away from your heart because your body wants to protect your vital organs to keep you alive. So my foot, I couldn't do that. I just couldn't move it and it was dragging. And that had started by that point after only about three months of properly purging every day. Um, so like my dad knew that I was trying and I think I'd been, I'd stopped purging for about a year. I'd been trying to stop. So when I came out of the room, he was, <clears throat> I think he was, he was crying, but he just gave me a hug and, so he'd heard you. Yeah, and he he'd heard me argue like the argument that I'd, I'd then stormed off from. So he knew why I'd done it. He knew why I was stressed, and he just gave me a hug and was like, "It's all right. I know why you just did that. Um, look, come on, let's go and enjoy the day. It's all right." Um. Uh, um. So yeah, but um, when that was going on with the self harm. I always tried to hide all my problems from my parents because I didn't want to let them down, even though they would have probably been there for me, or they would have. Um, but I think when I because I started getting in trouble and stuff so much at that age and getting arrested, it just became a routine to like have the police either bang on the door at my mum's house at silly o'clock in the morning looking for me, arrest me for something, search my room, turn half the house upside down and then take me away for a couple of days. Um, or me go out with friends and then end up getting arrested and not coming back for at least a night or th then the police bringing me home to my parents. It just became a routine for them to be there. There was one point it was every week for like three months, at least something, every, or two months, sorry, at least once a week there was some incident. All petty stuff. Um, like mainly all self-destructive stuff. Um, and this was before they knew. Remember you said they, when they knew, they said it all makes sense now. Yeah. yeah. So this is before before that. Um, so getting back to the self-harm sort of 12, that's when the eating disorders got bad, but I could never purge that much. So I would just starve, binge, and then purge sometimes, but um, just try or try and block it out with alcohol or drugs, but I only really had hold of weed at the time. I couldn't really get anything else, but I would have if I could have at that age. Um, but like, believe it or not, most drug dealers, when you're that age, have morals and won't sell to kids, a lot of them. And some of them are like, no, I'll, I'll only sell X, Y, Z to this age. Yeah, um, I'm not selling to anyone under, under 18. And it's it was annoying as a kid, <laughs> <laughs> but nice to know as an adult, like, um, so 14, I eventually got kicked out of that secondary school, the first one, and I hated it there anyway. I didn't have any friends. Like every group would say hi, but I didn't have anyone, any group that I could hang out with every day or no one that I could hang out with. Um, I think because I was so academically smart that I didn't really have much in common with the naughty kids, but I was too naughty to hang out with the smart kids. So it just left me in the middle and there was no one quite like me. Um, and sort of the whole way through junior school, I'd always been a tomboy wanting to just rough house with the boys and just, I hated girly stuff and anything that made me a woman because that's, I'd say associated being a woman with being abused. Just, um, I think as I got older, I realized it was just the abuse and PTSD and I do quite like dressing like a girl. And um, so 14, went to this new school and my mum deliberately put me in a school that no one would know me. So I'd have a proper fresh start because there was sort of three schools that were right near us, but there were kids there from my junior school that would have, <coughs> sorry, you're fine. That would have, there were three schools right near me. Um, but there were, they were all ones that the kids I went to junior school with were going and other naughty kids that I'd been on like this naughty boot camp thing. They, the police and the local schools and police put a army style, like knock some sense into your boot camp weekend for all the naughty kids in the area. But we just ended up meeting loads of new friends and having like the most fun weekend ever. <laughs> um, but all the kids from there were at these schools. So my mum found a school that was just outside the area, close enough to get to, but just far away that no one would know me. So I had a proper fresh start there. So all the kids that, hated me because of 
my first abusers drew spreading shit and getting everyone to hate me none of them were there that didn't happen at this second school so I genuinely had like a proper fresh start so I wanted to make friends and be kind of popular and make sure I knew that it wasn't just something wrong with me that it was just because I've met a few assholes that happened to know everyone that that was the reason no one liked me <laughs> um and I thought it might give um my twin a chance to not be associated with me so much because obviously she was she was still struggling with all the stuff I struggled with self-harm mental health um the eating disorders and that but she was a very quiet sufferer she never acted out um she it was very inward channeled all of her self-destruction so like quiet kids don't get help or attention and I think when you're struggling as a kid any attention is good attention um so I've started this new school and I think I was off school for about a good six months before this like because it just took a while finding the right school and getting a place there and getting a chance because they knew my history they knew that the reason I was suddenly moving schools to like well what was on paper a bit of a rougher school than the first one I'd been at but when I moved there like instead of having set form classes where it's year group forms they had mixed age groups form classes so it was more normal to be friends with kids that are younger than you and older than you it wasn't just like an uncool thing to be friends with like a year eight or whatever when you're year 10 11 um so i felt a lot more welcomed there and the teachers because it was a bit of a rougher school it's like the teachers knew that kids have it hard that age and that um they were a lot more aware of mental health and sort of drugs and stuff and all that that acting out is usually because the kid's feeling shit and I was never made to feel like I was in trouble for being mentally ill there which I had done at the other school um so I really loved it there and like it's like just join in on sports and like lessons, everything and art and got to do everything and go on trips, go on school trips to like theatre and just do all the normal school things that you should be doing that I couldn't do at the other one because either the kids hated me or the teachers hated me. Um, some of like the teachers hated me, it was justified, some of them. I remember once being told my friend had overheard a teacher saying with my first and last day, oh, you're lucky you haven't got Nita in your class. And the other teacher had said, she's lucky she's not in my class. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, so none of that at this new school. <laughs> um, and I, I attached myself pretty quickly to this group of quite well-behaved kids. And they were like mediocre on the popularities level, not too much of anything and just nice kids. And one of them like helped show me around um, and she hadn't been allocated to me. Like she didn't have to, but she helped me find my way around the whole first week. Um, but one of her friends was like, I think intimidated by me because they'd all been friends for years and just started being really passive aggressive and just trying to make me look like a dickhead. Um, so like challenged her to a fight and that was after like two weeks mm. of being at that school. But um, yeah, that was just the first bit of shit. So I stopped hanging out with her. We didn't end up fighting in the end. But, um, I think after I'd fell out with that first group of friends, I thought, oh, fuck, like, you know, no one's going to, I'm never going to find friends here. And all the other groups were, all of these kids have been friends since, like, primary school, if not, like, nursery. <laughs> so it's really hard to come in at, like, year 10, um, age 14, 15, or, 14, yeah, 14, turning 15. Um, I was So I was smoking on my own um, behind these sort of, metal crates that were outside and in, in, at like break time and I was smoking um and this girl come up to me um I thought she was gonna have a go and this is after I was gonna have a fight with um the girl from the first group um let's call her Ray <laughs> so Ray's who I was gonna have a fight with in that group making it really difficult for me to making it well known to me that I wasn't welcoming that friend group but that's fine not everyone's gonna like me that's okay but didn't feel like it at that age. But after the fight didn't happen, it's a couple of weeks later and I was smoking behind like a metal crate shed type thing. And this girl's come up to me with a big group of friends and I'm thinking, oh shit, like it, it looked a bit, um, I felt a bit uncomfortable. Um, Cause she, was, she came up to me and said, oh, I heard you were gonna fight Ray. 
um, what happened? And I was like, no, nah, she didn't turn up, but she said she was waiting with like 50 people. And I thought this girl was friends with her. And she goes, oh, shut up. Ray doesn't have five friends, let alone 50. And then we were just friends after that. She's like, don't smoke here, it's bait. I'll, I'll show you where you can smoke. Um, and she's like, do you, do you, um, do you like, do you smoke weed? Because like we're trying to make sure that I wasn't gonna grass on them. I was like, oh, I've got half a spliff in my bag, so we shared that. <laughs> um, and then I became friends with her. I'm gonna call her D. Um, yeah, these. Um, I don't. Don't want to. I want to. Don't want to give too much away without putting it in order. <laughs> mm. But D was really smart clever beautiful um but she'd been through a lot and i started hanging out with her i'd go on her estate and um i think i am 15 by this point um or almost 15 and i'd hang out after school she lived on this massive estate where all the kids of all ages would hang out together so it was so much more welcoming than where i lived um and because the only um, image these kids knew of me was just me being 14 and onwards. They didn't have anyone to tell them she's a dickhead or she's a loser, don't hang out with her. So they all gave me a chance and I, I was friends with everyone. And I could like, I, it, I still had that kind of thing of not having my own group of friends and just walking in and out of groups, except I had her group of friends and every other group would say hi to me and stop and chat from like the smartest kids to like the naughtiest kids. Um, and then obviously you meet all their friends and friends of friends and you just, I just ended up probably like, I had about 30 people that I could count on. Um, and we ended up in this big group of friends, I say big, it was about 20, about 15 of us that would come out all the time together. Um, and at least, yeah, it's about 12 to 15 of us. And we were just this massive group that would always hang out. And I felt properly sort of embedded in that group. And I think after hanging out with Dee, it's like, I remember smoking once and the ones who were at school, um, I turned around and everyone was following me. Like, as if uh, they're going, where are we going? Asking me. And I'm like, like as if like they'd really warmed up to me. Like I actually had a place in that group of friends. So you started to feel quite popular. Yeah. Um, and I was, I think one of the teachers that told my mum that I've stopped hanging out with the good kids and these are the naughtiest kids that I'm hanging out with. Mm. But um, yeah, we I'd, I'd hang out at her house after school, at Dee's house, met her family, they were all lovely. Um, I think the dad smoked weed, so it was we didn't really have to hide that around them. But I think weed was still, that was like all they did, so it wasn't um, like we couldn't <laughs> ask about anything else around them. But um, I felt like we got away with a bit more and we were allowed out to play out later than at my mum's. Um, so I'd stay around and we'd sneak out from hers at like midnight. My parents are too um, on the ball to, for any of us to have ever snuck out and got away with it. <laughs> but um, yeah, we used to sneak out and stay out till three or four in the morning and we'd go and meet up with our big group of friends and we'd go to the, one of the boys' houses, his mum worked nights, so we'd stay there till like five in the morning and then all we'd sneak back in to our houses or stay out on a field and just wake up like under like a sunrise, um, just laying on a summer field with your friends, like it was wicked. And we'd, if we stayed out all night, we'd have to stay out till like nine, 10 in the morning. Otherwise it'd be obvious if we go home in the morning. <laughs> so we're like, no, no, I stayed at so-and-so's house. Um, but I was still in a lot of mental pain and wanted to be out of it. So I started, we, we're talking about trying other drugs and I was bored of drinking and weed cause it made me fat. And I think she had a bit of an eating disorder as well. So we'd go all day trying not to eat and help each other not eat, I guess, like a real life antibody. <laughs> um, so one afternoon, I guess, after school, um, I think it was would have been near winter time, but it was a really sunny day. And um, we're just sitting out in the sun. I think we've been smoking weed and maybe drinking. Um, and I think I said, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we like, um, someone was talking about speed and coke and I was like, oh, wouldn't it be funny if we tried speed? And like two hours later, we had two grams of speed or base. Um, yeah, got it through friends of, I guess she had contacts, but she hadn't tried it yet, but she had people that she thought she could ask. Um, these were adults though, so they like only sold to us the ones. Um, but I tried it and it was just, 
no they just gave it to us we were like yeah yeah we've done loads before our, our dealer's not here like just trying to bullshit so that they'd sell to us because no one's going to sell to someone that's not used before um so we tried it it was the base like the powder um um not the powder sorry the paste and we didn't know how much to take so we just took like fucking quartered it and took um half a gram each <laughs> of base about half a gram maybe 0.3 at that no about 0.3 point, 0.4 0.5 sorry that's a lot which is a lot especially for like a still child's developing brain <laughs> but it was just amazing i felt um like i was flying and we walked around all night we walked like six miles and i was just flying and like dancing and laughing and running and like running in the bush uh, like uh, uh had to like jump and lay down jump into off the side of the road into a bush and lay down hiding after the police were looking for us because like we hadn't told our parents that we were just staying out and we just stayed out um i remember going to school the next morning we'd been out all night and we still had enough speed to keep going for the whole next day so we went to school and i'd left my school stuff around her parents house so we went to go and get it trying to sneak in at five like <laughs> i'll maybe cut that bit out <laughs> um trying to sneak in at like five in the morning or wide-eyed like like um, tiptoeing thinking we're being all sneaky but like if we woke her brother up I think <laughs> who was like a lot younger <laughs> um, but grabbed my school stuff went straight to school and we got in there early to have like a wash and brush our teeth in the toilets um, and these girls have walked in to like do their makeup and they're like have you been out all night and we're like yeah <laughs> and like, oh my god tell 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 like it's all exciting at that age isn't it <laughs> um but i felt happy on that and like i was flying and the whole next day like i thought i was doing amazing in my school work but i wasn't i was probably just rambling and chatting so much shit to everyone but it made me so confident i couldn't speak to anyone normally and i spent the whole day just talking to everyone having really deep heart to heart conversations with anyone <laughs> i sat next to because i was still really new at that school <laughs> i was like dancing and I think I was on report already. I was on like a naughty report. I think from day one when I got there, they said that was a deal of me coming to the school was I was on report. Um, so one of the teachers wrote, mm, seemed a bit over hyper and dancing around a lot. <laughs> Um, I'm like, well, I was like, oh, miss, I'll hand the books out and deliberately running, like handing one at one end of the classroom and then one at the other end, just back and forth, back She's and forth. She's a rocker. <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote a rap about it, <laughs> <laughs> which I like, still remember half of. It's so funny. Are you uh, able that to bit. Oh, a rap? Yeah. yeah. Come on, bust remember. out. Just the chorus was like, I'm not going to wrap it, but like the chorus was... Um, Please wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one day. But the chorus was like, a friend with, with weed is a friend indeed, but what I want most is a dose of speed. Swallow it whole, snort it like me. This is what it feels like to be free. <laughs> I can feel a blood pump through my veins. My whole body shakes and my teeth. If I break words, can't describe it. I'm at Heaven's Gate's going to be sick, but I never felt so great. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, so get back on my um mc in career <laughs> <laughs> oh we'd all write raps as well at that age all the kids on the naughty estate on d's estate it was something we'd all do high and not many of us um not many others of, of our group would use it was just us two and the rest of them were sort of in weed and that but um i think like the kids would come up to me um asking i think someone asked me if i had a cigarette once and it's after we'd been on speed and coke and i was like no nah, i don't smoke it's well bad for you <laughs> and she's like wait but you do like speed and cocaine i'm like yeah that's this opens your mind up like just <laughs> stupid and like they used to find it funny the kids that i'd stay for an hour after school to, um for triple science it was like um so you'd get three science gcse's instead of one and they're like wait you're in triple science and then you're going off to do like hardcore drugs and just <laughs> it's now such like a walking contradiction <laughs> did it help you with the studying I think it did like in small doses and obviously just for that day and then after it was like I think because I was depressed when I took it I just felt amazing and so I used that whole day at school and the first time I've used I used all night stayed up all night walking around and then gone to school probably stunk like <laughs> um used all day at school bombing did another bomb I think we let it die down and then did another bomb perked up at school and then carried on using that whole next night stayed up the whole next night and then eventually ran out and crashed and I think we were trying to buy more on that 
second night and we couldn't get any and it was just really shit but I remember we went and hung out with the people that had got it for us and they're like fucking hell how much did you do like you look fucked and we're like oh we did bombs this big and they're like what the fuck you're only supposed to do this much oh no one told us <laughs> like mm. sorry <laughs> um and on that first night that I had done it I think I had oh no sorry the second night so after we've done it all all day or all night um and then all day um I'd gone home to my mum's and my eyes were just massive and um oh no it was sorry it was on the first night I'd popped home at some point in the evening I must have gone back out um my memory gets a bit muddled sorry <laughs> but I'd gone home and I think mum had noticed my eyes or it was the next day she'd noticed my eyes and was like like um Nita come here um I need to check something like and got my dad um, like, have you taken something? I'm like, what? No, and just bullshit my way out of it. Um, oh, I'm like, some of the excuses I used to use, like, oh, I just had this health drink. Yeah, it's got loads of vitamins in it and it's made my pupils big. Like, <laughs> well, I've been swimming. That's why my eyes are red. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I remember catching a glimpse of myself in the mirror after I'd been using for like a whole day and a half and it was the first time I'd used any uppers. I thought, fucking hell, and I hadn't eaten for that whole time and it's been running around like a loony. Um, but I liked not feeling empty with the eating disorder, physically not eating. It made me feel strong and just enough, like worthy of love, which I didn't feel like when I've eaten um, because... At judo, as a kid, it's like I was constantly praised for losing weight. So I associated, I think, I subconsciously associated losing weight and being skinny with success and making everyone proud and being enough and gaining weight with failure, quitting judo and just being a loser and letting everyone down. Um, so that's why I started hating fat. And it wasn't so much the way I looked, it was just as long as there's an ounce of fat on my body then I'm a failure and I've let everybody down. Um, so obviously the drugs helped with that. And I think we didn't use for like a good month after that because we just couldn't get any. And then when we eventually found someone willing to sell to us, they wouldn't do speed. They only had Coke and MDMA, but we didn't, or it was cu Coke cut with MDMA. I think looking back now and knowing what drugs are supposed to look and taste like it was Coke. But um, yeah, we just had a mystery bag. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so we bought that paid like 20 quid for a, like a gram which was I think we were told it was cheap that time but obviously the next one we'd have to pay full price but um so we bought it off a guy called K for the purposes so me and D have gone to meet um K it's not their real initials <laughs> um but um yeah he'd given us some and then we'd gone off had a really good night stayed up all night um didn't eat for two days and went to school and was just loving life for I was just just not feeling shit um I'm really sorry something happens after the speed I forgot can I cut back to that quick yeah <laughs> yes. go for it. um so on the come down from the speed I felt so su suicidal like because I was suicidal before the before I did the speed I felt so much worse I think and prolonged it wasn't just suicidal feelings that I was feeling coming off the speed it was like I was physically hallucinating nooses um hanging off things and and bridges and buildings any tall buildings there was a old warehouse that was abandoned that we used to go to and um we used to, like break in there to nick copper to strap <laughs> um to strip copper wires to make money I was gonna say how did you pay for your <laughs> habit <laughs> uh so get get to that one <laughs> But um, I'd never steal from my habit. I've never ever stolen and rarely borrow money off anyone. Um, but I think the come down from the speed, I was just so depressed that I'd gone to school. And um, I remember I was so depressed this one. Uh, I was so down. I think it was the first week, that whole week coming down of speed. And I couldn't focus in the lessons. So I was allowed to go and sit in this teacher's office. Um, but so I do that and then I think coming home from school I just hide out in my room thinking oh well I'll hide my eyes from my family then they won't see me and I was self I self-harmed quite badly um sort of the biggest can I 
just the biggest one on my arm and it needed stitches and it, I remember the sound because I think I'd, dad had, I'd had a row with dad about the fact that I'd been using drugs so I didn't admit to it but they knew that I'd used something to speed um they might have even found out but um yeah we'd had a massive row and I felt really guilty so I went and did a cut and it didn't hurt enough. I wanted it to hurt to punish myself. So I pressed down as hard as I could and I felt it rip and it went past the skin, I opened up like um, this shape. I could see the fat. And then after the fat, you've got all the veins and stuff. Sorry to be a bit graphic. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I remember saying like out loud, oh fucking well done. <laughs> oh. Um, and I thought, oh shit, shit, I tried to cover it up. I had to rip a chunk off a towel. I was just in panic. Ripped a chunk off a towel to tie it round and it bled through five layers of towel wrapped around it. Oof. So I got a string from a shoelace and just tied the towel around it to try and cut it off the bleeding. Um, I think first I tried to run water on it. I don't know why I thought it would clean it, but fuck, ugh, it hurt so much. Honest to God, I nearly screamed. I think I did scream. Um, well, I was so scared I didn't know what to do, but I couldn't tell my mum and dad it had gone all the way across from one side to the other of my wrist. So I went to Dee's house and I ran all the way there. It was three miles away. I ran all the way there, um, bleeding. <laughs> and actually, no, I didn't run there. It was running. So that's another time self-harm. I got a lift off my mum and covered up, tied it with a towel and just sat normal and acted normal in the car, just like yeah can I have a lift like like proper chill just like I think I'd been I don't know if I'd been did I don't you not know feel how. lightheaded from losing all the blood yeah like I've lost I'd lost at least a cup of blood like I know that's not in massive measurement terms but I had lost quite a bit um and I'd thrown up as well and gone really white my mum had asked if I was okay I was like yeah yeah I'm just gonna have a couple hours um even put on a smile and made a joke or something and I've got to Dee's house and <sighs> I can't remember if I just said Dee's name or not, so. No. Okay. <laughs> um, got to Dee's house and um, I think I called her saying, I've done something stupid. I need your help. Can I come round? Um, can you get your mum or something? Like, I, I've done something stupid. I need your help. So she told her mum, like, they were prepped for me coming round with an issue. But I didn't tell her what I'd done. And I said, they knew that I self-harmed before coming round. The mum knew. And I like, sort of opened up to her a bit about it because it's it was nice I had that kind of, that friendship relationship with her mum that I could open up to them about things I couldn't tell my own parents and they would keep it private even if it was sort of unless it was literally going to kill me that day but I think even then they would have kept it private if that's what I wanted which I think it's important to have that um and what's it word what's the word when you don't you don't tell the parents of what someone's done with confidentiality confidentiality that i think it's so important to have confidentiality even at that age um but so i've got around there my mum dropped me off and i act normal and like as soon as my mum's car's gone i was just like <gasps> oh. i like let out all the breathing and everything and it was still tied at this point this sort of tea towel size towel that i'd ripped um was tied around my arm and I got in there and I was like, done something stupid. And she's like, all right, right, what's wrong? And I was like, uh, she's like, have you, have you done that? Sort of, because she knew that I'd self-harmed. And I was like, yeah. And she's like, got her mum. And her mum's like, right, let's see then. And um, I remember I opened the towel up and Dee was like, Ugh, like, fr like almost threw up. <laughs> and her brother's like, oh my God. Like, um, <sighs> but the brother was super helpful, blessing me. He was, I think, about 12 at the time. And he went and grabbed, I think, the mum either used to be a nurse or something similar, but she knew how to dress wounds properly. And she looked at me and she was like, you need stitches, mate. You need to go to hospital. And I said, I don't want to. I'm not going. Can you just fix me up as much as you can, please? So she got, um, it was like, I think she had sterile, made sterile water, salt water. So I bit down on a towel and they held my arm out. Um, they held my arm out, I think, with one of the brothers um, while I bit down on a towel. And I think they just helped me hold, hold me still while I kind of screamed to cover up the sound of this screaming. It's making me feel really queasy. <laughs> Carry on. Um, <laughs> oh. um, um, yeah, then she dried it up, basically did butterfly stitches and bandaged it up and I was good to go. <laughs> um, then I think we ended up getting what it would have been. 
the coke soon after that where we couldn't get speed but we ended up finding coke and md it must have been only a week after the speed then i guess because it was still on the come down that we managed to get that so after the self-harm about a day or two after and managed to get some well he it was a miss it was a goodie bag we were told with coke and mandy but um like looking back now knowing it it was mostly coke um so we again didn't let on that we hadn't done it before so we got it and then i think we did it on a railing didn't know how to rack up or cut up or anything we didn't do any of that we just this powder poured it on something and knew that you're supposed to sniff it and that was about it so we tried that and then gummed it i think at first i think the first couple of times d only gummed it and didn't sniff um but i sniffed it first time i wanted to go all out like if i was going to do drugs i was going to be the druggiest druggie and do more, more than anyone like as with everything in my life <laughs> um so this is still um, 14 years old. <laughs> wow. <laughs> or um, maybe just turning 15. Um, so we ended up using a few more times, but it was really hard to use more than once a month because it was so hard to get and we didn't have much money. So now 15, ended up, the person we bought the coke off said that he could get, um, so Kay we'd bought off, said he could get us a half ounce of speed. I'd sold, I was like, I think we'd found an abandoned warehouse and everyone had just been playing in it, but I saw all these copper wires and I'd done that. My dad was a builder, so I'd strip, uh, strip copper wires to take down to the scrappy and get money for him per kilo. And I saw all this, I could just see all this opportunity in there. So I was like, right, come on, we're too young to work. And, but oh, oh, not from rich families. So I was like, bag up anything metal you find that's look this color, that means it's worth if it's not, it's brass. We didn't want, <laughs> I was like, right, this is the color you look for. So um, we went down, I think the next day with loads of us and they were all asking me, right, is this worth money? Nope, chuck that, is this one? Yep, yeah, that one's good. <laughs> like Bagging up like suitcases full of freaking wires and pipes. And <laughs> you need <to> stuff. <laughs> <laughs> we ended up all, um, um, the whole next weekend, I remember going to Dee's house and our whole family were out having us <laughs> strip all this copper we ended up getting about I think 600 quid between about four of us so my share I think it was 200 pounds um I think we had 200 each our share because we a load lo loads of people helped us stri um, strip it so we would sort of give them some of it <laughs> mm. um so worked my ass off for like three days I had blisters all on my hands all cut up from doing the wires and went into school, I couldn't even write with um, a pen because I had so many blisters and cuts all on my hands from stripping wires. So I went and scrapped it after the weekend and got 200 quid each. I think it was like a Tuesday or a Wednesday and um, we'd scrapped it and got the money, scrapped it all weekend. Then Tuesday or Wednesday, we had our money and it's like my parents kind of knew what I was spending it on, but it's like, well, it's your money. You want to waste it or you go ahead. And I think if they, <laughs> um, but we're not going to pay for it. And it's, um, I've always been quite good with money. I'd always save it, but, but with drugs, I'd only ever buy enough that I could afford. I'd never go over. I'd never take, I'd, I'd never borrow it without paying it on the day. Um, and I, I'd never do it. If I had 50 quid left to my name, I'd only spend 10 and I had 30 quids worth. I'd always save myself something. I wouldn't ever, even at the height of my addiction, I'd never just, I was never one of these sort of drug users that just spends absolutely every penny on it. Um, but I was 15 now, craving drugs more and more and realizing how much they helped me lose weight. And with my eating disorder, that is, I'd say 80% the reason sometimes that I stayed on them. And the more I was doing drugs and staying out a lot, the more I was still getting arrested and the more problems it was causing at home. So my family relationships got really difficult with my parents and I was like treading on eggshells and stuff around all the time. Um, so I prefer to just stay out. So after the wires, after the money, we ended up going to Kay cause thinking, okay, we'll get, he said he can get us a half ounce or whatever amount. It was a big amount of, it might've been 12 grams. It was, a, it was an odd amount now looking back that <laughs> they don't come in. <laughs> but, um, yeah, we went all like happy and excited with this money and we met up with him. We were in our school uniform stupidly and 
we've gone to like a park and she said, I was like, do you trust him? Because this is a lot of money, you know? Like we've worked our ass off. Do you trust him? You promise? She's like, yeah, no, he, no, he won't fuck me over. Get to a park. And then he's like, yeah, it's my mate's house, but it, you're not allowed in. So you got to wait over here. And I was like, fucking smelt a rat already. Like even at that age, I don't think I'd ever been bumped before by any dealers, but I, I knew this isn't good and we waited I was like do you trust him and I but I I didn't trust him but I trusted her and she trusted him so but mm. and we didn't really have a choice because it was like well otherwise we're not going to get any so I'd rather risk losing it all to maybe get it than not and we knew where he lived so I thought he's not going to fuck us about is he we knew where his parents live that's where we'd been going to um oh he was 24 by the way 24 or 26 and we're 15 so that comes in later the fact that we're in our school uniform and that and he's that was what he used as an excuse was yeah because you're in your uniform um you can't come in this guy won't sell otherwise um so d's like yeah seems legit so he's gone we wait it's not no sign we wait we call him stops answering we wait i think we were there about maybe two hours and i was like should we just go like he's not coming um it's like really disheartened and sulking I think we went back to school because we were bunking off to go and get this and my phone had been confiscated at the beginning of the day and you get it back at the end so we'd gone back to school to get my phone back <laughs> um I remember walking through the gates I think it was about home time by the time we got back and obviously feeling really shit and still on a come down from speed except now I've lost all my shit and I just cut my arm up the day before with the stitches or two days before that and been awake that whole time just from depression um yeah went back in feeling really shit and um I think got my phone and the teacher she just hated me she's the reason well she is she's who I hadn't she is she was oh, this teacher was the person I argued with that got me kicked out of this school, the second school. <laughs> um, so she gave me my phone back. She said, oh, left something here, have we? Um, and she said, the police came here looking for you two today. Um, oh, wait, no, sorry. Um, is that later? I don't know. No, I don't I don't know. <laughs> the, um, the police would frequently come in to look for kids at that school. Um, so really disheartened I think I was crying I think my mum picked me up that day and she said I was really pissed off and upset and she said so the police didn't come that day that's the next day can I start that bit again so yeah, it was kind of kinda easier um, so we've gone back to school to get our phones uh, to get my phone that had been confiscated earlier in the day and there's a teacher who gave me my phone she I've had problems with her I felt like she had it in for me from day one she gave my phone back um, had a bit of a go at us for bunking off all day um, but couldn't hold my phone any longer so I took that and then my mum picked me up and I was obviously on the verge of crying because I was so pissed off and just like shit all my money's gone what am I gonna do there's no drugs I need it and um mum picked me up and she asked what was wrong and I was such I don't remember this but she said that I I said oh you wouldn't understand um Whereas looking back, I think she knew exactly what was going on. And she's oh, um, a few more conversations later, but on the same car ride. She's like, oh, well, um, what, what about that money? Oh, you've got money to go out, haven't you? I'm like, um, I didn't, but I didn't want to say that. Um, I think I would have said something, oh, it's, it's, it's all gone, don't worry about it. <laughs> um, so I was so pissed off and upset and still on a fat come down from speed that wasn't in the right head place and probably the worst and most I say psychotic I wasn't hearing voices as such but I was hearing whispering and I was getting really suicidal and homicidal impulses which weren't diagnosed because it was always as a kid even with the self-harm I sort of forgot to say my dad's and lots of other people made it feel like if I asked for help, I'd be just locked up in an institution for life and that's it, the end. Um, so, um, <clears throat> with me sort of base hearing things that I knew probably weren't there and hallucinating like a noose to hang myself from and every bridge or high building, I'd look at it and think, oh, um, how many stories is that? Would that kill me? If I, how, how would I have to position my body to, you know? So, with all that going on and the money I went back out and I went to see D after school 
Um, and I had a petrol scooter at my parents' house and it had a full tank of petrol in it, which is like five, uh, five gallon, what's the big jugs? Five gallon jugs, I think, or five liter jugs, sorry. And, um, this is before electric scooters. <laughs> um, it was just like a push scooter, but run by petrol. Um, I took the petrol from that and put it in a drinking flask and I took it out with me and I wore a grey tracksuit with a white t-shirt underneath a jet black outfit and um, put the petrol flask in my bag. Um, I said to Dee, like, I'm going to burn that cunt's house down. Um, so we went out and I felt like my mind was so out of it but I, she'd sort of told the rest of the gang like oh um really like by the time I got to D she'd already told a lot of our friends oh Nita's gonna do this Nita's gonna burn Kay's house down yeah he's fucked us over and I've come out with this tank of petrol and it felt like too late to back down and anytime I'd sort of said to them oh you know like that I've done something really out there try and look cool I wouldn't back down and not do it after everyone knew like I did a crate run once which is I don't think anyone ever had actually done it I think kids just bullshit about it but they said oh yeah it's where you go into a shop grab a crate of alcohol and you run out that's a crate run so I did it with a 24 <laughs> crate of super tenants which is like a nine percent lager oh, yeah. <laughs> um so now with the fire thing uh with um saying I was going to burn his house down I felt like I had to do that um, got to his house. I was like, "Dee, show me where it is." You know, it's quite a significant looking house. Um, there's like loads of ornaments and stuff. Like you couldn't miss it. Got there, and I've got the petrol, and I'm wearing my black track suit over completely different coloured clothes. Um, with like a mask over my face and stuff. And I think my adrenaline was just going so crazy. And I seem for like almost physically hearing voices like, do it, do it, you have to do it, you know, you come too far. And um, I was going to originally, I had a towel that I was going to put it on and then put it through the letterbox, but then got to the house and I heard a baby crying from next door and I saw people walking about that weren't Kay. They weren't him, I think it was his parents. And I thought they've not done anything wrong. They could have a baby in here they might not be able to get out all right. And it's, he was a big guy. He was about six foot six and 25, 27 stone. Like I couldn't knock him out. He's massive compared to me. Um, that's, I don't know why it seemed like the logical thing to do would be the fire. But then I thought like, I don't want to kill anyone. And even in that depth of psychosis, not everyone can do this. But for me, I, I thought like, this isn't okay. So I just thought I do want to scare him though. So he'll give my money back. Um, Did you do his car? No, we didn't have one. So I set light to the fence. I just poured petrol all over the fence outside in like a line that it would not do the house. But I mean, I wasn't really thinking that, but it was just, there was someone acting really odd, like well, not just me, but um, <laughs> opposite. I had something like window peeping, moving the curtains and that. So I knew I was kind of being watched because I probably was acting really suspicious. Like mm, I'm in an R and do I, don't I, stinking a petrol outside this house, hiding behind cars and all sorts. Like, so I just, I think I burnt out the fence and um, it wouldn't go up properly. So I just kind of poured petrol on it and pretty much left it at that. Like I'd gone up one little panel, but then it'd gone out. Um, so I just dribbled the petrol everywhere else and then left and told my friends that I'd set fire to it because I just didn't want to back down with the embarrassment. But then about 10, 15 minutes later, we heard sirens and fire engines and smoke coming from that house. So it wasn't, it was the CO2 from the carbon dioxide from the fire engines that had come out and sprayed the fuck out of the fence just to make sure nothing did go up. They'd come, so the neighbor who'd been stood up or who'd been peeping outside and acting a bit weird at the window had seen me and called the police and said, I'm acting suspicious, it stinks of petrol, this, you know. And as soon as I walked away from the house before I'd gone back to my friends, 
Um, about the second or third car, I walked behind maybe 30 feet away. I took off my top layer and I had my gray clothes on underneath a completely different color. Um, so I stripped off the black clothes, put gray ones on. I hid anything that stunk of petrol because I got it all on my sleeves. Stick, I hid anything that stunk of petrol in this one bag and I was going to throw it over the fence, but I liked that jacket and I didn't want to get rid of it. <laughs> so I took it home stupidly. Um, but yeah, the fire engine came out and like they shut off that road for like uh, um, that whole night to just make sure nothing happened. And they'd obviously asked, Kay, is there anyone you've pissed off in the last few days? Because this is like two days after. And um, I remember, well, I think my mum, I got my mum to pick me up. I just pretended I've been hanging out with friends and I stunk of petrol and was wearing different clothes. <laughs> So she's like, why'd you reek of petrol? And I was like, oh, we went motorbiking. Yeah, my friend's got a dirt bike. Just bullshitting because like, you know, kids had mini mopeds. And she's like, where's your jacket gone? And I was like, oh, D got cold. So I've given her that one um, or we swapped. Um, it's like excuse for everything. <laughs> got home and my bedroom as a kid was in the loft. So I had eaves, which were cupboards that went around the entire um, length of the house. So when I got home, it was the perfect hiding place. I hid my bag of clothes that stunk of petrol. I hid them straight in there. Um, went to bed thinking it was all chilled. Like <laughs> about two o'clock in the morning, one or two in the morning, we get a knock. Uh, it's the police banging on the door, looking for me. I didn't hear them because I'm two floors up my bedroom. But um, I think I heard like, a, oh, fuck's sake, what, she, what have you fucking done now? I'll come from downstairs. <laughs> um... So, yeah, I woke up to police coming in my room and sometimes when they'd come and search me, I'd just swap rooms with my sister and say, yeah, that's my bedroom. So they'd just search my sister's room and find nothing. <laughs> Clever. <laughs> um, but, yeah, they searched my room. Um, I think they did arrest me that night, but they didn't have to take me down to the station. It was like, we'll arrest you, but we, like, we don't need to... Because I... I was in my like bike pajamas, obviously no bra on under a t-shirt. For, and I was obviously when you're that age, you're a kid, you're growing. It's a bit weird to have like two male coppers on your own in your bedroom. Um, but I was such a little shit. I'd like use in front of them when they were arresting me. If I was in my bedroom and I had my hands free, I'd like grab drugs and just start sniffing them in front of them. <laughs> um, so um, it was really embarrassing. Like they found little baggies with, we used to put um, like open up tablets and put them in drug bags and then sell them where it would just be like paracetamol. Um, but they found, uh, I think it was crushed up diet pills that I powdered, I'd put in made into powder. And they found that on a booklet with loads of like screwed up diet plans. <laughs> <laughs> with that, like I've done for like three days and then just scribbled up. So they were like, what's in the bag? We're guessing it's speed with the diet plans. But then he looked me up and down and was like, like had a like he couldn't be asked to have a heart to heart with a kid today but <laughs> um was like well you don't need to lose weight there's nothing wrong with her but then the other one started being a dick so i grabbed a can of deodorant and did that you did what um i don't want to encourage the people that don't know but i grabbed something to use in front of him and it's something that can freeze your throat if you do it wrong I know that thing that. So he's grabbed my throat and pushed me down on, <laughs> backwards on the bed. I was like, right, stop fucking about. But obviously, um, I was like a teenager, no bra on basically in my fucking underwear and a t-shirt. Um, so yeah, that could have felt a bit weird. <laughs> I was like, no, I was like, oh, no, I'm done, I'm done. I'm sorry, like, I'll be good now, I'll be good. <laughs> so he didn't even cuff me. <laughs> So um, then did they take you to the station? No, not that night, but they searched my room. But where I'd hidden my clothes that were covered in petrol and reeked in the eaves, they didn't even open those because it doesn't look like a cupboard. It just looks like it's the loft. So, um, or he might have even opened them, but I'd shoved them right down the back of it where you couldn't see. So I was, oh no, that's just the insulation to the roof. Like <laughs> what's in there kind of thing. Um, so they didn't find anything. And... They went, I went to school the next day and um, I think the police did come to the school the next day after school or we met them just after school and they wanted to interview us and 
they had been on that day. I'm really sorry. They had been actually on the day that I went to pick my phone up where we've been bunking all day and we've gone to try and score. On that day, the police had come in looking for us, I think, to ask for some other shit we'd been up to. But um, this time, I think we did end up... So I'd been arrested, um, but I hadn't been interviewed yet. And I think... Right. So the police have searched my room. They didn't find anything. And... Um, gone to school the next day my cut's still bad I think a teacher had found like the cut and the teachers by this point knew we were on drugs because the police had said stuff to them and I thought oh sweet they've gone you know no clothes not like they hadn't found my clothes or anything but um I think it was about halfway through the day and the police turned up at school arrested me in front of everyone and we're like I was like we've already done this and they're like we're on further evidence and they changed the charge from arson with we're arresting you for arson with intent to endanger life and I was 15 had to go with them I couldn't even bring my like school stuff or anything I couldn't get changed and yeah shit on myself but still in a headspace mental enough to um be kind of out of it and still kind of psychotic <laughs> so yeah uh, quite a lot happens after that and I've learned some really horrible truths um because of sort of what happens next um with the whole arson thing but D didn't get arrested either just me which I thought was weird because um originally it was all both of us equally so they've just come into school just to arrest me and not D and um, I think we'll leave it there for now <laughs> oh my god I've sat here for three and a half hours mesmerized by Nita's story this is a master class for people who want to come on the podcast I've sat here I've hardly said anything the level of detail the length of the stories this is just a master class in storytelling and I urge people to go down to Nita's channel which is going to be at the top of the description box below this video and support what she's doing my god I can't to go through the things that she's been through and to come out and to be she's multi-talented she's how old are you when you wrote your, your life story i was 18 when i st wrote it. it took me a year so i was 19 when i published it so i've been reading it and the the, the intelligence in the writing the, c the creativity of the sentences she's really ahead of her time and <laughs> what do you think about what you've heard jen Fuck i'm just blown out. away <laughs> yeah. absolutely blown away there's, I know there's so much more to come as well. And you're 26 now? Yeah, feeling old. Thanks so much for letting me share my story. And well, we haven't finished. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to do a part two. and But just to put this in the context of the mission on of this channel, you know, through my own experience in prison and meeting people in um, the deep end of drug addiction and then interviewing so many people on the channel, who've gone from addiction to very heavy crimes. It, 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 Nita's story here is, is showing what we have come to conclude over the years, whereby the root cause of crime primarily is childhood trauma. And the horrible things that these predators do to kids in particular sets their brain in a way whereby they're not given the tools to deal with it at the time. It's hard to even fathom what they're going through at the time, like Nita's described so expertly. She didn't even understand properly until she reached puberty, you know, and that it was this evil thing that had happened to her, the extent of it. And then it, it, it causes such a frustration of the brain and a PTSD load in the brain that they've got no one to talk to, the parents don't know, and there's nobody giving any counseling or anything so to, to to address that tension in the brain drugs is the quick solution it, it is and it puts them on a path then that just leads to criminality it leads to the pol police it leads to suicidal thoughts it can lead to death so many people who are on this trajectory end up killing themselves and for Nita to come out of the other side of it through this darkness to channel energy into literature into her youtube channel and into all the positive things that she's doing now 
it's just you know it, we, we, we all have to salute her bravery so please let us know in the comments what you thought about part one of this journey we, we, we're going to be doing part two um pretty soon and just you know absolutely amazing um to see need to come out the other side of it and, and be doing so well now thanks so much yeah, for having yeah. me yeah cheers yeah, cheers yeah. i'll give you a hug oh. Oh. Oh, bless you, man. You did so well. Oh. <laughs> yeah, well, 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 done. well done. Well done. Well done. Yeah. This podcast is sponsored by Gadfly Press. We are proud to announce the publication of The Girl Gambler, a young woman's story of her escape from gambling addiction. The story of a young girl's entrapment in gambling addiction. The true advert for problem gambling and how it controlled her every movement, every thought and almost took her life. How the guilt and shame that go hand in hand with addiction stopped her from reaching out for help for eight years as she didn't feel it was okay for a young female to be a problem gambler. How she believed it was a male dominated problem and how eventually she did find the tools that enabled her to become free of her addiction. Available worldwide on Amazon, link in the description box below this video. Thank you for supporting our sponsor. Here at Boomer and Jen, we offer a wide range of organic or recycled clothing. We all know our planet is important. We only have this one. So it's vital that we all work together to slow down and reverse the changes to the environment. Whilst we all know that big industry are having a significant effect on pollution, here at Boomer and Gen, we believe that if we all make small changes, we can do our part. Fast fashion causes detrimental effects to the planet. Not only is nearly 20% of global wastewater produced by the fast fashion industry, but there is a considerable amount of fast fashion ending up in landfill. So let's move away from fast fashion items that are only worn once or twice and start wearing extremely comfortable, durable and environmentally friendly clothing and ethical jewellery. Boomer and Jen was founded in a quiet town in Devon in 2018. It has now gone from strength to strength as the world is becoming more aware of the current climate situation, helping our customers to buy sustainable, quality clothing. All of our products are fair trade and registered with the Global Organic Textiles Standard Association. Check us out on organiccottonclothing.co.uk So, Gadfly Press is hugely proud to announce the publication of Killing Escobar and Soldier Stories by Peter McAleese. If you've not seen our podcast we've done with Peter, check it out. And the book is now available worldwide on Amazon in all formats. And Peter was hired out of Scotland, mercenary by the Cali Cartel, to assassinate Pablo Escobar, one of the most famous gangsters in the history of the world. The mission is all detailed in the book, as well as Peter's many soldier stories from various countries and continents of the world. So mind-blowing, gripping, as seen on BBC TV. This is the book, the story that Killing Escobar is based on, Peter McAleese's testimony. The link will be in the description box below the video, available worldwide on Amazon. Cheers.